Welcome to another episode of Stephen Wes's Untitled Podcast. Seriously, they haven't picked a title just yet. This week's cinematic contenders are Sunset Boulevard. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. And the Maltese Falcon. Help me, Mr. Spade. I need help so badly. And now, and now, from Burbank, California, it's podcast time with Stephen West. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another podcast. Yes, welcome. It's been two long weeks. See, I feel like it's been two short weeks. Well, you say tomato, I say tomato. All right. You say, I've actually been saying tomatillo. You say falcon. Bogey says falcon. I say falcon. Oh. No, you're I don't in, say that. You're in the bogey camp on this one. So, we did two movies last week. We got two movies this week. Uh, it took us, you know, two weeks actually to watch them. We 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 finished the podcast last week, and we were like so excited, and we were so, you know ready to watch the movies we pulled out of the bucket, and oh, then yeah. we spent a whole week not doing that. Well, we spent a whole week not having time to do that. Sure, is all. sure. Um, but real quick, I'd like to I'd like to just say thank you to Dwayne Sawyer for doing our intro. Uh, we really appreciate the help. It's lovely. Everybody, think good thoughts. Sort of. I, I don't know if Dwayne has a Twitter. <laughs> I don't think he has a Twitter. I was going to say everybody tweet Dwayne and thank him, but um, his name is Dwayne Sawyer. Dwayne Sawyer. Look for Dwayne Sawyer on Twitter, and if you find the guy that you think could have written this thing, then uh, follow him to and the, retweet yeah. him. Or, I mean, if really, you find him on Twitter. We'll let you know exactly which Dwayne Sawyer to tweet. You said written this thing. I'm not quite sure what that. I mean, he he he's throwing some music in there. Yeah. I mean, it's like I think he's finding some existing. Oh, music. I thought he was composing it. No, first. I don't think so. Oh, you could have told me that. I would have just believed it till the day I died. Oh, okay. Yeah, he composed it. Thank you for composing that music, Dwayne. Yeah, thank you, Dwayne. So, moving on, we have. Let's deal with the titles. Let's talk about our the name of our podcast. The name of our podcast. Yeah. Briefly. So the name of our podcast is Untitled right now. Right. We we put out a call to arms to the listeners and said, hey, tweet at us and tell us what you think the title should be. Please. And we got many titles back. So we have narrowed it down to three-ish, three or four. Yeah. I'm not sure. Four right now. Four. Okay. And we... Um, we need help deciding which one. So we're going to explain them. We're going to tell you what our favorites are. And then uh, you can tweet at us and let us know what you think it will be. And basically the people get to decide. So yes, go for it. What are the names? All right. If you like these names, tweet at either Steve in North Hollywood or Movie Hippo mm -hmm. or No Lag Gamers. No Lag Gamers. So you got three options on who to tweet or tweet all three. And the titles we're voting on are... My personal favorite, the horse I'm betting on in this race. It's simple, it's clean, it's recognizable. Indiana Jaws. Indiana Jaws. Okay. I don't think it needs much explaining at all. But we're a movie podcast about movies that people should have seen by now. Mm -hmm. And boy, if those two aren't at the top of your list, then that means you either have seen them or you're looking at the wrong list that you yourself composed. But uh, I love Indiana Jaws. I think it's a funny little pun. And so that's getting my vote. I, uh, I Just real quick. Yeah. I, Please. I spent some time with some good friends of mine, um, the Shrums. Oh, the yeah? Shrums. Yes, they, uh, they came down um, from Oregon. And they said they love Indiana Jaws. Uh, they did not oh. weigh in on Indiana Jaws. However, one of them, I won't say which one, one of the has shrubs. not seen what? either Jaws nor Indiana Jones. Wow. And I had to just set down the things that I was carrying. <laughs> Whoa. Um, yeah, I was so I was blown away. We would all so if that wins, it might be in their honor almost. It it could it could almost be in their honor. So Hasn't seen any of the four Jaws films. Hasn't mm -hmm. seen any of the four Indiana Correct. Jones Correct. So that's eight films that they could have seen. Wow. And they have not. So. That is wild. It is wild. Uh-oh, I hear somebody jumping around outside. Oh, I like it. 
We got a lot of movement out in the hallway. Okay, and so what's the next to the thrill? What's the next title? Oh, that's somebody's gonna knock Ooh. on the door here. Go, go for it. What's the All next right. title there, Steve? The next title, up for your voting pleasure, is "View the Right Thing." Oh, the mailman's arrived right here during our show. That's perfect. I hear, I hear DVDs in these packages. I like the sound of that. Maybe we'll open those later in the show or something. So, so far, to be voted for, Indiana Jaws or View the Right Thing. Now, I, I do like View the Right Thing. It's a callback to a very famous uh, Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing, which I watched a lot as a right. kid, and it played a big part in my, uh, in my, in my rearing. View the Right Thing is my, my pick. It's my that's favorite. your number one pick. Yeah, it's my, it's my, that's, that's my jam. I'm going to move right. my mic here. I shouldn't say stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Probably the best Spike Lee movie. Yeah. Um, at least the narrative ones. Yeah. Uh, Four Little Girls, which is in the Muppet Bucket, because you haven't seen it. I've not seen Four Little Girls. I can't believe Filthy it. Filthy little animal. Um, I'm not that little. Um, you know, you're not. Um, so that one's a documentary. So, you know, that's probably his best film. Yeah. Documentary-wise. But narrative, I think, do the right thing. I'm a big fan of Crooklyn. Sure. But, uh Yeah. I have a friend who was in Crooklyn. Yeah? Yeah. Hi, Tiasha. If you're listening, hi. Hi, Tiasha. Do you know who is she in Crooklyn? I forget the name of her character, mm. but it was like, I don't know. I mean, she was very young in the movie. Sure. So she was one of the little girls in the movie. I forget Maybe her the cousin. Name, Maybe the cousin. Something like that. That sounds correct. She goes to her cousin's house, and her cousin's like kind of like a little better off to do. That sounds about right. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Good movie. Good movie. Yeah, Crooklyn. Check that out, too. But the titles we're talking about are mm-hmm. View the Right Thing, yeah. in honor of Do the Right Thing, which you should also watch, and Indiana Jaws. Now, there are two more on the list that people can vote on. Mm-hmm. This one's also really good. Yeah. There's something about movies. This is a fantastic title. Yeah. It, it's uh, definitely um, is an example of our love of films. Right. And it references a film. References a film that I love. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's great. Um, I took a dear friend to see that the night it came out back in 98. That, sure. I think. And uh, it was a great time. I felt like it really raised the comedic bar mm-hmm. in terms of being hilariously funny, but also using some pretty gross, gross out humor, but using it in one of, you know, in some very smart ways that haven't yeah. been done before. Franks and Beans. Franks and Beans. Oh, man, that guy. That guy's in True Detective this season. Oh, okay. I can never remember his name. And he also played Meatloaf in the VH1 original movie about Meatloaf. So, Indiana Jaws, View the Right Thing, There's Something About Movies. Okay, and you said there's a fourth one? There's a fourth one. Okay. Uh, same guy who, who, who suggested View the Right Thing on Twitter. Uh, he, he claims to be a droid. He also suggested two jerks discuss movies with zero droids. Well, and kinda, I felt kind of hurtful. I felt we needed to talk about this because we are, you know, as I look back over the list, I was like, wow, droids are not represented in these movies that we're going to be discussing. Well, hold on. Okay. So, uh, first of all, that would preclude the idea that we're never going to, or I mean, that we would talk about droids in the future. Who knows what will get added to the Muppet bucket? That's a great point. We also, I'm sure, are going to talk about Star Wars The Force Awakened. Oh, yeah, when that comes out. When that in, comes uh, out. Five more months. Yeah. Um, I mean, we won't go into yeah. depth on that, but we will talk about it. Sure. Uh, but I happen to know for a fact that there is one movie, at least one movie, in that Muppet bucket that has a droid in it. Oh, really? Yep. Really? I can't think. Well, Dune uh, mm-hmm. has something sort of like a... It's not Dune. I mean, it's if we're saying Dune. If we're saying a droid is a robot... Sure. Ro- robot? Robot. Robot. Uh, then... And, and in the Spider-Man. sense of Star Wars, that's what the droids are. They are robots. Yeah. yeah. Um, then uh, we have a movie in there that, that's got a, a droid I, in it. I can't. I mean, obviously, I don't have the, the bucket memorized. But mm-hmm. I can't think of anything with mm-hmm. a droid. Or, well, are you going to tell me the title of no, this movie, Wes? No, I'm going to let it be a surprise. Okay, then. So, uh, so I mean, not that I want to eliminate something right now, but we kind of have to eliminate it. We I have mean, to. I, 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 it's, it can't. Because, I mean, A, he said it. From kind of a mean place. Yeah. Because it wasn't two guys discuss movies. It was yeah. two jerks. Yeah. 
Do we want jerks in the title? I mean, other than the jerk. I mean, with Steve Martin, when has the word jerk being in, in a title ever really served anything all that well? Yeah, I'm gonna say let's let's nix that one. I'm sorry. Cross it off. Sorry, and well, but he's also got a, another title suggestion in there. My so, favorite, my favorite one. Yeah, a really great one. So okay, so if you guys could let us know via Twitter which title you like the best. If there's another title that you have that you think blows these out of the water, feel free to let us know. Please, we'll extend this thing if we come if we have another amazing title. Right. Um, so once consider. again, it's Indiana Jaws, or view the right thing or there's something about movies all right Should oh that was uh that was submitted by uh space colonizer yes. on twitter so thank you for that submission and space thank colonizer. you for colonizing space yeah i appreciate that kepler what is it 24b what was it again you, you, is he up there uh, I, I don't know is he tweeting from the kepler already i, I hope not that'd be pretty cool um, uh, if you have no idea what that means, NASA revealed that they discovered a planet a lot like Earth this week. Yeah. It's exciting. It's very exciting. So, uh, real quick, let's talk about um, a movie or two from the theater. We're not going to do any spoilers. We just want to say we saw these things, this is what we liked and or didn't like. Right. Um, so, and so let's go with Ant-Man. Ant-Man. Lead the, lead the charge on Ant-Man? Leading the charge on Ant-Man. Well, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I saw it in 2D uh, because I'm still not 100% sold on 3D, although I, I will fully admit it has gotten leaps and bounds better just within recent like years. Like I remember seeing Thor 2. And thinking, wow, this is the best 3D has looked so far. Yeah. And it's certainly been <coughs> as good since. But um, I only saw it in 2D, and I definitely want to go back and see it in 3D once the crowds die down. Because mm-hmm. I want to see the, uh, you know, the ant size world. When, when I want to see that in 3D. I think that's going to be great. True. I saw it in 3D. You did? Yep. I really liked it. Um, I, I thought the 3D was a lot of fun. Um I may have I, f- I feel like maybe there's a Marvel movie or two that might be better 3D wise. Okay. Interestingly, um probably has to do with the director. All right. Um but I will say this, you know, I I I do like gimmicks in the theater. I um I I honestly believe that that is how we get new and better technology in the theater. All right. Um I mean surround sound was a gimmick at one point. True. You know, um widescreen uh, cinema like uh, Panavision, that was a gimmick at, at one point. Color was a gimmick. Talkies were a gimmick at one yeah. point. You know, so um, so I'm a fan of gimmicks in the theater. Um, the Barco experience, which is one of the newer gimmicks where they put extra screens on the sides to sort oh, of immerse right. you a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm I'm a fan of that. I'm a fan of the idea of innovation and trying to find new ways to to tell these stories. Right. Um, so I'm I'm a fan of 3D. Um, I uh, you know, when 3D's not good, it just usually means you can't tell that it's 3D. Right. You know, it's usually there's not enough depth um, to to the film. And what's the harm in in that? You know, there's it doesn't hurt anything to to not have it. Um, sure. I guess maybe it sucks a little bit to pay a dollar to three dollars more surcharge for 3D glasses, but. Um, well, you're not paying for the glasses, by the way. You're paying for the fact that there's a new screen in there. Right. But um, but when 3D is good, it's great. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy is a really good example of a really yeah. fun film in 3D. Um, and 3D enhances the experience of that. Nightmare Before Christmas is another really good example of a movie that is is made fresh and new with 3D. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who, like, all of a sudden they see, they go, hey, have you seen Nightmare Before Christmas in 3D? And I say, yeah. And they're like there are so many things I never noticed about that film. And it's because now all of a sudden you have the depth and you're noticing like they put a lot of stuff in the foreground and a lot of stuff in the background that you just sort of ignore. We've sort of trained ourselves to ignore those things because they're not in focus perfectly or or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I'm a fan of 3d. I thought the 3d and Ant-Man was decent. Okay. Um, I I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to what's coming next. Um, regarding Ant-Man and that crew. I right. thought the end credit sequences were... There are two. If you right. see the movie, stick around. Um, I thought they were both excellent. That's exactly what I want to see out of a Marvel end credit sequence. Right. Um, you know, the Guardians left me disappointed. Um, 
Oh yeah. Uh, Age of Ultron left me well, kind of disappointed. Age of Ultron didn't even do one at at the very end. At of the very end, they right? did. They did one about two minutes in. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you know, but the but the end credit sequences for this are exactly what I want. I want. I want a great tease for what's coming next. A yeah. really great tease. It is so hard to talk about this without giving anything away. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, buddy. I almost just want to move forward. <laughs> so let's go. Let's let's move on from Ant Man. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the other stuff. Well, you know, what? I will. I'll talk about one other one. I saw Mr. Holmes. Oh yes, um, With and Sir Ian McKellen. Yes, I really enjoyed the film. It's um, it's not a fast paced film. You know, it's uh, it feels you know like kind of like when you read the books. The books are not fast paced. Sure. Um, there's just a lot of information given, and that's kind of what this is about. This is like a character piece, and they sort of capture the feel of reading those books. All right. Um, without really there being a real mystery per se i mean there is a, a bit of a mystery but okay. it's not it's not a huge deal it's, sure it's not like a sherlock holmes solving a murder kind of mystery right n- not exactly no okay i mean i don't want to give too much away but um but if you like sherlock holmes and you and you like ian mckellen's performances go see this movie it's um it's it's really worth it it's a very fun time i like so. the sound of that and there's a very fun easter egg in it yeah to be on the lookout for. Yeah, I'm not going to give. I'm, I'll give a hint. The hint is black and white. That's all I'm going to say. Sure. That's it. That's an all right hint. Thank you. Oh, y- you know the other thing about it is, um, it's a little sappy. Oh, it is. Yeah, I I do like sappy though. I okay. I, I like a movie that's um, that wears its heart on its sleeve. Okay. So I mean, it doesn't it doesn't work in every film. You know, I don't want every film to be like that but um in this case it works really well um you know because part of the movie is sort of about um this aging sherlock holmes and his relationship with this young boy um and so there's there's some sappiness going on in there there's some sort of like you know the the boy doesn't have a father and Uh. uh um and he's inquisitive and and uh he's a reader all right you know and he wants more for his life so, um, so yeah, the sap level is high, but it's, it's... Is it as high as, like, saving Mr. Banks? Sure. It is that high, okay. Yeah, probably, yeah. I okay. mean, it's, it's probably up there like that. Well, that's good to know, then. Yeah. So be prepared for some sappy. Yeah, but it's good. That's it's fair. Sappy. I like it. That's fair. So let's move on. Yes, uh, let's. Did we discuss the position of the movies we've watched so far? The position, like what order on we watched the, them in? Uh, well, on the AFI. No, uh, we haven't. We should though. All right. Um, so we've watched we watched four movies now. Um, yes. Two of which we're about to talk about. But so Steve took a look at the AFI um, top one hundred lists. There are multiples, um, there and because they've kind of redone them, times. moved things off, you know, move things around, things shift. And he's looked to see where these things have fallen. So so what do we have so far? All right. So last week we watched Sophie's Choice. Uh, which was number 91 on the list. However, it was 91 back in 2007. It does not seem to be on the current top 100. But it's still Sophie's Choice. Right. So if you're listening to this, and you've listened to our first episode, and you still haven't watched Sophie's Choice, I think you know what you need to do. The other movie we watched last time was uh, North by Northwest, which is number 40. So I like that. It's right inside the top half of the list number 40 north by northwest Mm -hmm. this week we'll be discussing sunset boulevard which is number 12 wow that's pretty close to the top yeah that's great and we'll also be discussing the maltese falcon which is number 23 so that's the michael jordan of the afi top 100 list doesn't lebron james have the same number is lebron james 23 i think so I'll admit, wow. I'll admit, I don't follow basketball like I used to. Um, ever since my beloved Sonics were moved to Oklahoma City, I uh, I haven't watched since then. I understand. I'm heartbroken. Speaking of LeBron James, mm. he's in Trainwreck, currently in theaters. Yeah, you've seen that. I, I have. have seen it. I got to see Trainwreck at a screening with John Cena, Amy Schumer, Vanessa Bear, and Colin Quinn. Nice. And it's very funny. All now, right. I will throw this in. I am almost genetically predisposed to enjoying the heck out of Judd Apatow's movies because I just love his movies. 
So take that into account. But I really enjoyed Trainwreck. The friend that went with me really enjoyed it. And everybody in the theater really enjoyed it. So see Trainwreck. Great. All right. You know, since we talked about Trainwreck, yeah. I'm not going to get too heavily into it. Oh, boy. Um, but I do feel like we should just address it. Sure. Um, there was a shooting um, in Lafayette, Lafayette uh, it, during a screening of Trainwreck. And, yep. um, you know, it, it reminds me of a few years ago when there was a sh- the Batman shooting in Aurora, yeah. Colorado. Ooh, really? Ooh. Um, and Let's I just, call it the Aurora and not the Batman. Sure. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Yikes. I do. I, I want to say something. And this is kind of what I said because people asked me sort of what my thoughts were back then. So I want to just address it because my thoughts stay the same now. And um, obviously this is – we talked last week about my church, you know. Yeah. Right? That, that the theater is my church. So it's like – you feel like the theater is supposed to be this safe place, and when something like this happens, it sort of makes you question what's safe and what's not. And um, people out there, um, there are plenty of people that are ill, that um, do horrific things, um, that sort of violate that those safe spaces. Um, we shouldn't let that deter us from the things that we love in life. Sure. And, don't live in fear. Um, don't live in fear. And we should embrace why we go see movies. The reason why we do this podcast is we love film. We love right. to escape. And so I say when stuff like this happens, don't shy away from the safe places or the places that you thought were safe embrace those places because a place like a movie theater needs your support it needs your your business so um you know get out there and go see some movies and uh um you know i don't want to i don't want to take away anything from the the crime or the horror sure. of this uh, or the sadness but um it's our responsibility to be resilient and uh and push forward so Go see some movies, please. And as Mad Eye Moody says, constant vigilance. Sure. So, as a person, I'm discovering apparently there's sort of a, a complex called hyper vigilance mm-hmm. or something like that, or maybe hyper awareness. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm realizing that I might have been living with that all my life because I'm way too vigilant and aware of my surroundings at all times. Sure. But hey, it's served me well. Sure. So, constant vigilance out there, folks. Okay. So that that said, we're done with it. Let's Great. dig in. Let's talk about the Maltese Falcon f- slash Falcon. <laughs> so, without without going into detail, I just want to get your general opinion about this film. Did you like this film? I'm almost not even sure. Yeah, I'm in a weird place with the Maltese Falcon. Okay. Or Falcon. I gotta stop. I'm just gonna stick with Falcon from okay, here. Okay, Falcon. On. Falcon it is. Uh because growing up, being into movies all my life, I always knew I've gotta see the Maltese Falcon one of these days. Mm-hmm. I've simply got to. The fact that it has taken me this many years to finally get around to it is insulting to me. It's insulting to movie buffs everywhere. Cause it's always as far as I've known, it's always been such an important movie, and I just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And now that I've seen it, I feel a bit let down. Oh, okay. Now... Didn't live up to the hype, is what you're saying. It's sort of... I, it came out in what year? Oh, like I, late 40s, early uh, oh, 50s? Oh, early 40s, I think. Early 40s, okay. So I can see how for its time, it was probably a totally awesome, outstanding movie. But watching it, in 2015, it was a movie that mostly took place in either an office or a hotel room mm-hmm. with two or three or four or five people just talking mm-hmm. about what they just did or talking out a plan for what they should do. And it rarely ever showed them actually doing any of the things that they were talking about. Yeah. Now there's, you know, there's one scene where it shows a guy get shot Mm -hmm. and there's a scene where it shows, you know, uh, bogey arriving at that 
I think it was a boat, right? At the big ship. Yeah, and the, the ship the is on fire. Sure. And, the, and that scene is 20 seconds. And the shooting scene is maybe 20 seconds. And then everything else is just people in rooms talking about the details of this whole mystery that they're involved in. Right. And that, I feel let down by that. Okay. That's fair. Okay. I, I really like the film. Um, I I don't think it's... Uh, the film all on its own is the most amazing film I've ever seen or anything. Sure. I think there are... And I'll, I'll, we'll get, we'll, I'll come back around to this a little bit later. But I think there are things about the film and about the making of the film that are really unique, especially for the time period, that that's one of the... Those are some of the reasons that... Um, people love this film so much is because right. it gave us other things. So I like that. Um, so we'll we'll kind of get around there and we'll see. My guess is, you know, as we talk this through, maybe your opinion will change a little bit. Um, maybe mine will change a little as well. But um, so let's let's kind of get started and just kind of see where we go. So to start with, this is a movie based on a book. It's it's a movie that has been made um, a couple of times prior oh. to this. Um, and since this film was made uh, under other titles. So um, this wasn't exactly a story that was not familiar, but like a lot of remakes, they, they definitely put their own spin and, you know, tried to um, make it maybe either more accurate to the book or, or, or um, add something that the others couldn't kind of add. All right. And uh, so this movie, <clears throat> it starts with uh, detective yes. Sam Spade sitting in his office and, pretty much immediately we learn that Sam Spade is maybe a kind of a gray character. He's kind of a neutral character, right? Yeah. Um, he seems really ambivalent through most of the movie. He kind of plays the devil's advocate the whole time. Yeah. Um, you're never like really a hundred percent sure if he's serving the law or if he's serving himself hmm. because a lot of his actions and a lot of the things he asks people or says to people sort of implies that he's sort of serving his needs or wants, right. right? Um, he's identified really quickly as a ladies man. Oh yeah. Uh, his secretary comes into the, to the office and says, there's this woman outside. This Miss Wonderly is outside and she's a real knockout. Yeah. And you, and then you kind of like perk up and <laughs> bogey perks up. So, um, so it's our, sort of our first indicator. A few scenes later, we find out that Sam has been having an affair with his partner's wife as well. Right. Um, furthering this idea that he's kind of a womanizer um i i think he maybe would have liked a relationship with his secretary effie yeah as well except i think she's too smart for it probably she seems to be this the certainly the smartest woman in the in the uh whole film right well you were you you gestured like you were going to say something i was going to say was it clear that he is having an affair with his partner's wife or are they in love but not, you know, consummating that love behind his partner's back? I believe that the reference is that he's been having this relationship with um, this man. I think there's a couple of a this couple man. of things. I'm sorry, this, this man's <laughs> wife. OK, pardon me. Uh, but there are some, there's anything wrong with that. No, there are some homosexual undertones later in the film, which we can talk about. But that's true. Huh? Um uh the there's two references to i think that he's been having an affair with her one is that he just flat out kisses her and they've clearly have the secretive thing going on yeah um because they they have this conversation and closed in his office yeah um and she she sort of implies that maybe he killed his own partner right. because he was in love with her. I guess that could be just a love thing and not, but I don't think it would go that far if I hope, more I hadn't hope happened. Right. The other reference is his partner comes in when Sam is talking to Miss Wonderly and um, who we think is named Miss Wonderly. We find right. out she has a different name later. So Archer comes in and he gets eyes for Miss Wonderly, not knowing that Archer's married at this point. Right. Um, and he, you know, he first he sits behind her and he makes eyes at, at Sam. And then he comes around and he flat out says, you may have seen her first, but I spoke up first. Yeah. I claimed her. And I think the point with that is 
Archer claimed his wife first. Right. And Sam gets her. And Archer claims Miss Wonderly first and Sam gets her. Yeah. So um so I think I think Sam and uh Mrs. Archer are Shagging. Uh, yeah, I think they're they're entangled in something else. So making the beast with two backs. Sure. <laughs> So, uh, so the woman says she's uh, Miss Wonderly. She needs help getting her poor innocent sister away from this terribly manipulative and mean man named Mister Thursby. Thursby. She describes him as violent um, and uh, and very manipulative. And and she tells Sam and Archer where they can find this Thursby, and they're going to go and see if they can get the sister back or talk Thursby into. Getting the sister back. Basically, Miss Wonderly sort of like implies that there's an arrangement made where she's supposed to go and speak to Thursby. Right. So they go to speak to, or go see Thursby themselves. Um, and of course, Archer's like, I got this because I like this lady. Right. So um, while he's on a stake on the stakeout, um, Archer is seen practically greeting somebody he he kind of straightens up and smiles yeah and a gun is pulled out and he is shot he sure is. and then he falls back over a railing or through a railing and into a ravine down a i don't know a hill yeah into a ravine sounds right so um sam finds out that his partner's dead and he goes to visit the crime scene, and he's hardly at that crime scene at all. He doesn't go down and look at the body. Right. He just talks to um, the detective there, and then he hightails it out of there, basically. Yeah. Um, he calls. He goes to a payphone and calls the hotel that Miss Wonderly's at and finds out that she has checked out. Yes. So he goes home. And he is visited by the police and questioned, but not for so much for the death of his partner. Right. But because Mr. Thursby has been found murdered. Bum, bum, bum. Exactly. So now he's sort of a suspect. Um, right. There are two detectives. One um, is sort of buddy buddies with him. The other one doesn't really like him and wants to pin the crime on him. Right. But there is a respect between the two. Which I feel should be pointed out. Yeah, there's a respect between the two. Maybe not so much by the end of the film, but no. at least early on, there is a respect of the two where they, you know, Sam sort of just like flat out says, like, what's going on? What is, what's the deal? And then they reveal that Thursby's been killed, and that's yeah. why they've been questioning him. Um, okay, so I know I'm whipping through this story fairly quickly. It's, uh, it's, it's a long story. a lot of stories. There's, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. So the next day uh, in the morning, he gets a call from Miss Wonderly and asks uh, him to come to an apartment. He does a little research and finds out that the apartment is registered to someone named LeBlanc. Yes. Um, he gets there and he hears a lot of like lies and half-truths from this woman. And he confronts her about the names. And, of course, her, she, he finds out that her name is really Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Bridget O'Shaughnessy. So, uh, so she, her thing in this moment, in the scene, is that she's feeling him out. Yeah. Trying to figure out how much trouble she is in. Right. Because she's clearly linked to the death of Archer, um, at the very least. Uh, Sam doesn't trust her. Tells her that he doesn't trust her. She sort of reluctantly hires him on to find out who might be behind the killings. Uh, because um, Thursby apparently is someone she met on a trip to the Orient. She says, yes. So now she, so now we know she's, she personally, not her sister, her imaginary sister. Right. Um, we know that she is definitely connected to Thursby. And so she is worried for herself. So later on in the film, um, Sam goes back to his office. He meets a man named Cairo. Yes. Played by Peter Lorre. Good old Peter Lorre fantastic in this film yeah um he definitely plays sort of an effeminate character um yeah i would say so possibly implied homosexual homosexuality there yeah. um there's also some stuff a little bit later on with a man who's following um uh bogey but we'll get to that right. in, in a minute um so cairo shows up and he asks if there's a connection between the Archer death and the Thursby death. Right. And it turns out that Cairo is working for a an unnamed employer mm -hmm. and is trying to find a statue of a bird. Right. 
and it might be linked to the killing of Thursby. So he's trying to figure out if the Archer death is connected, because if they are, then it's something he needs to know about so he can find this bird. Right. He offers Sam $5,000. It's a lot of money. Right. Especially then, uh, to help get the bird. Then, he immediately pulls a gun on Sam. Right. How are you feeling so far? I'm feeling like you are very accurately summarizing this movie. Yeah, do you, is there anything you want to bring up at this point? Not real. although I feel like we missed that um, the reason the police question S- Sam Spade mm-hmm. about Thursby mm-hmm. is because they know that Spade's partner, Archer... Was tailing him. Was tailing Thursby, and so therefore they think it was Thursby that killed Archer, and therefore sure. Sam killed Thursby sure. out of revenge. I, I definitely glossed over that. I, I apologize. You 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 are correct. So that's just what they think. None of it is clear, though. No, it's it's all it's all like fast dialogue. Yeah, and um, you got to really be paying attention and not be sleepy. Yeah. And no texting during this movie. No. Let me tell you, no. No texting during any movie. No texting during any movie, but uh, so well, I mean, like you can text from Justin to Kelly. You're you're allowed to text. <laughs> so I, the reason why I stopped here is I wanted to talk a little bit more about Cairo and just kind of see what you, your take on Peter Laurie's performance. All right. So he pulls this gun on Sam um, after he offers him this job, and it's a little like you, you get a little taken aback by it because. Peter Laurie plays this so genuinely. He plays yeah. him so convincingly that you don't expect him he seems um very proper yeah um very put together you don't expect him to pull a gun no so of course sam disarms the man right um knocks him out rifles through his belongings finds money finds um a passport with the name cairo on it so he's telling the truth about who he is um a few other things um and when the guy comes to sam gives him the gun back and they talk a little bit more, and then before Cairo leaves, he pulls the gun on Sam again. Right now, the whole reason he's pulling the gun on Sam is because he wants to search the office to find find out if the Falcon is there. Yeah, um, and it's not. And and the second time Sam gets the gun pulled on him, he just kind of laughs it off and he's like, "Search away." Yeah. So um, later on, as Sam is he leaves the office and he's moving around trying to do some investigating. He noticed he's being followed by a young man. Right. So he hops in a cab and the young man hops in a cab and then Sam goes to an apartment building. He hits all the buttons on the buzzers and yeah. gets in, goes out the back door while the uh, the young man is uh, looking, trying to figure out which apartment maybe he went to. Yeah. So he slips the tail. He heads to go see Bridget. Uh, and of course, she's like, "Oh, I'm so innocent. I'm. I have no idea what's going on." Right. And then he mentions that he met with Cairo, and she stands up, and she has this look on her face. So now we know that she knows Cairo. Yeah. So he tells her about the five thousand dollar offer, and she kind of. I don't know if recoils is quite the right word. Okay. But she sort of withdraws because she's like, I can't pay you $5,000. I can't pay you that much. You're, right. I mean, I need you to help me, but I can't pay you that much. And he basically says, and this is womanizing Sam Spade. Right. Uh, Money is not the only thing you have to offer. Whoa. Bogey. So that's that's out there. Later on, Spade calls Cairo, asks for a meeting to join forces between he, Bridget, and Cairo. Yeah. Let's all clear the air. Let's get this together. Now, at this point, we don't know exactly, but what Sam's trying to do is he's trying to figure out why this bird is important. Clearly, right. the woman's connected to the bird, and then Cairo's looking for the bird. So, what's up with this bird? Why is it so important? Why is a statue of a bird right. causing this much hullabaloo? So, he, t- he basically lets Cairo know that he's acting as an in-between for, for Bridget. And that she wants to sell the bird. She says that she wants to get rid of it because she's afraid of the connection to Thursby and she doesn't want to be connected to his death. And so she just wants to get it done and over with. Um, and she tells him that she can have it within a couple of weeks, within, within a week, I think, actually. Yeah. Um, and she wants no trouble from the fat man. Right. The fat man named? Or should we get to that yet? We'll get to that. All we'll right. Get to that, I think. <laughs> uh, so 
things get um, kind of out of control between uh, Cairo and the woman. They clearly have a history with each other. Yeah. Uh, we obviously don't know what that is yet. Um, so Cairo, she slaps Cairo. He pulls a gun on her. Yeah. It's a pretty extreme He's escalating reaction. the situation a little too much. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how the extremes that the characters go to in this, a little, like maybe closer to the end of this. But, All right. Um, so Sam disarms him and slaps him himself. And the guy gets mad about being hit. And Sam Sp- Humphrey Bogart utters what I think is maybe my favorite line of the entire thing. And he okay. says, when you're slapped, you'll take it and you'll like it. Nice. And I, I just, th- I got a kick out of watching him say that to, to Peter Lorre. Yeah. It was, uh, it was yeah, a great because, line. Well, we should point out Peter Lorre is probably the the smallest of all these characters. Of yeah. all the men, for like, sure. Yeah, the, literally the smallest in stature. Yeah. So, and he's got a very, like, bullied feel to him. Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, he's clearly risen to some sort of criminal power. But it seems like he has just taken a whole lot of slappings and beatings throughout his life. And and sort of that bullied thing is kind of a theme in this. Um, there's there's two people, three people that have power, but really two people that have power in this film. And that's Sam Spade and the fat man. Right. And um, all the people that are under them, whether um, Cairo is under Sam at the time or under the fat man at the time or... Um, the young man that's tailing Sam yeah. as well. And, and um, Bridget is also kind of falls under them and they all kind of, they're all manipulative. They all think that they're smarter than the fat man and Sam. Right. Um, and uh, they all eventually kind of get put in their place at various moments of the, of the film. This is true. Um, I think, I, you know, talking about Peter Laurie, I think it's really, it was really great casting um, he's weak when he needs to be, and he's kind of scary when he needs to be. Like you know, all of a sudden he just kind of flips on a dime. He's got those bulgy eyes. Yeah, and, yeah. So he was. That, um, he's that a lot of fun. Spray to watch. on tan that he's wearing. <laughs> Did he seem tan in this? I mean, it's a black and white movie. But yeah, he I don't know. I don't know. Very tan. I didn't think about movie. it. So Where's Cairo on? leaves the apartment. He leaves with the police officers. That's something that doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, Sam tries to figure out why the statue is important, um, but he doesn't really seem to care about the value. Um, obviously, it's worth a lot of money if multiple people are trying to find it and he's being offered $5,000 for it. Um, it's obviously valuable, but he doesn't really seem to care about it. What he seems to care about most is why it's it's so valuable. Yeah. Uh, so Bridget tells him that she was hired to steal the statue for 500 pounds with... Thursby and Cairo. All right. But she and Thursby were going to double cross Cairo. Of course. Later she found out, or she tells Sam that she found out, that Thursby was going to double cross her. Oh, boy. So that's why she hired them to follow him and to deal with Thursby for him. Right. So, of course, Sam doesn't believe her, thinks she's lying, tells her so. I feel like she is lying in almost every scene. She lies in every scene, at least a little bit. I think I think there are some scenes where she tells a little bit of the truth. Yeah. Uh, but, like, for example, um, she definitely was going to steal the bird with Thursby. Yeah. Um, so, after a little more failed digging, Sam gets a call while he's in his office from the fat man. The fat man's name is Gutman. Right. Gutman, Mr. Gutman. And Sam kind of figures it out, too, because it's like, what's it? His secretary just says, a oh, Mr. Gutman called, and he's kind right. of like, Gutman? Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. And it's like, you see him put together that, oh, Gutman is probably this fat man the I've fat been man. hearing about. And he's got an impressive gut. He does. Need him. That guy is over uh, 300 pounds. That man. Whoa, all right. That actor. Stage actor. This was his first film. I think he's brilliant in it. Um, so Sam goes to the hotel where Gutman is staying, um, and Gutman, of course, is this like he he's sort of almost like this jolly, friendly, welcoming guy. He gives him alcohol and a cigar, right. and um, Sam just just again just wants to know why the bird is special. Yeah. Um. It comes down to this: Gutman wants the bird and knows why it's special. Sam has the bird, wants to know why it's special. Sam wants to make some sort of deal. Yeah, he wants the money, and Gutman certainly has money. So 
So Sam tells Gutman, I've got the bird. Cairo, this guy named Cairo, has approached me and he has offered me $10,000, which is obviously more than he was offered. And he just, he, he's like, I just want to know why the bird's special. Gutman kind of balks at him. Sam loses his cool, throws his cigar on the, on the ground. Um, and he demands to know if Gutman is in or out. Right. He's like, if you want the bird, you need to tell me what's up and you got to pay me the money. Right. He tells him Gutman has till five o'clock to give him his answer. So Sam leaves and on his way out, he kind of like grin. You get this grin from him to yeah. kind of show that he's losing his cool. Although it's definitely an act and he's maybe, maybe a little in over his head with this. Even. Oh, see, I thought the grin was that. Because throughout the whole movie, he keeps his cool so very well. And right. I thought the Grimm was to say was he was smiling at himself for for pretending to lose his cool. So I think that's what the smile is. I think the smile is. But okay. where I'm going with this is yeah. his hand is visibly shaking. And he looks at his hand oh, right. before he gets on the elevator. And I think that's to show that... That yes, I agree that he's been pl- he's been playing it cool, and he's convinced this guy that he has a hot temper, yeah, um, and that he's losing control and um, maybe being able to be manipulated. Um, so that's what he convinces Gutman. Um, but because it's all an act, and because maybe he's in a little bit over his head, okay. and there's a lot of moving pieces, he's got this like shaky thing going on. Okay, he gets on the elevator. The other elevator comes up at the same time, and who should walk off that elevator? Mr. Cairo. Mr. Cairo, and he heads toward uh, Gutman's room. Yeah. I I believe implying to us that they're working together. In cahoots. Sam is still wanted for questioning over the murder of Thursby. Right. He goes to the DA, who he knows, sort of implies you guys have tried to pin stuff on me before, You know, it didn't work then. It's not going to work now. Right. Um, But clearly he needs to get his name clear from this whole thing. So besides the fact that he's been hired by multiple people to find this bird and get to the bottom of this, he has an arrest looming over his head. Yeah. And he needs to figure out what happened so that way he can can get out of it. And find his partner's killer. Yeah, that's... That should be his top goal. Although, I, I gotta be honest, I think he knows roughly, I think he has a good idea of who killed his partner at this point. So, <clears throat> Sam, at, on his way out of the district attorney's office, he's confronted by the young man, uh, Wilmer. Is yes, his name. that's his name, Wilmer. Um, and uh, Sam, throughout the thing, refers to him as a gunsel. A gunsel. Now, I thought... I feel like I've heard this word. It, well, it's a derogatory word, and this is where we're, we're going to talk real quickly. I think it's kind of controversial. All right. Um, it's, uh, I thought it was like, oh, like a gun cell, like a sword cell, yeah. like a, somebody so who just worked, you know, I'll sell my gun for money. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll shoot whoever you need. Apparently, that is a um, homophobic derogatory term oh. about homosexuals. So throughout the film, he's calling him this thing, and... It, I I always got the impression Wilmer doesn't like Sam just because Sam always gets the better of him. But yeah. but Sam's actually poking him and suggesting that he is gay. Yeah. And there is no indicator that he's gay. I think Sam Spade is just a homophobe who, um, who, you know, it's like in the eighties when people would would say the other f word. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, and that's incredibly offensive as well. So, um, so anyways, he has this uh, hate hate relationship with this right. young man. Uh, Wilmer takes Sam back to Gutman, and Sam's like, "Oh, I thought you'd be waiting till five oh five to to let me know what your answer was. All right, you let me know earlier than I thought." So he gets there, and Gutman finally explains. What's up with the bird? Yes. And that the bird was supposed to be this rare gift for the king of Spain. And it was made in the 1500s. And the bird is encrusted head to tail or head to claw, I think is what they say, yeah. with these beautiful gems, fine jewels. Uh, but when it was put on a ship to sail for Spain, 
the ship was attacked by pirates and the bird was not seen again. Right. For a long time. A long, long time. And then about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years prior to when this takes place, Gutman is told that um, the bird reappeared in the late 20s and it ended up in this antique shop in Greece. Yes. So he gets this call. He's like, yes, I'm going to go to Greece and I'm going to get this bird. But by the time he gets there, the shop has been ransacked and the bird is gone. I should note that the bird's appearance has changed over time. Drastically. Drastically. So Gutman tells Sam that uh, to hide the bird, and so that way it looks like it's just some ordinary statue, it has been covered in black enamel. Yeah. Just to make it look like a heavy bird. It is, is it made of uh, solid gold and then encrusted with jewels? I, th- I believe so. That sounds like the story. Yeah, because then uh, it's a very heavy bird. Although... With the enamel on it, I don't see the jewels. I don't see any indication of the jewels anywhere. Yeah, I'm that not... That struck me as odd. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, and then I started thinking about it. I was like, well, maybe they're just like really like flush with it. I don't know. Oh, that could be it. So... Could be some flush jewels. Flush jewels. Gutman offers Sam $50,000 for the bird. Um, before they can get too much into the money, Sam's vision starts to get a little blurry. Um, realizes he's drugged. He passes out on the floor. Wilmer comes out, kicks him in the face. He really does. Hard yeah. in the face. And then Cairo comes out. Yeah. So now we are we have this confirmed that Cairo has been working with him. Um, perhaps Sam suggesting that Cairo offered him 10000 is was maybe a mistake. Yeah. And, and gave away his position. So um, eventually Sam comes to with nobody in the room. Right. He starts tearing the room apart, looking for something, splashes the water on his face, and he finds a newspaper clipping in the hotel regarding a cargo ship. So he's like, I'm going to go see what's up with this, because clearly they've torn this out of the newspaper. It's important. Right. So he goes to the dock to find the cargo ship in flames. Yes. And the guy, uh, the I don't remember if he's a fireman or if he's a police officer there, tells him. Yeah, I think he was like the fire chief. Yeah. Um, tells him that the crew got out, everybody's safe. Um, so, and it was arson. Right. Sam goes to his office. His secretary's there, and they are confronted by this man who stumbles in, carrying this parcel wrapped in a newspaper. He drops it on the floor. It sounds very heavy. Yeah. And then the man drops dead in the drops office. Dead. Of course, the parcel is the bird. Which bird? The bird. It's the, the falcon. Maltese falcon. So, Sam checks the bird <laughs> in a hotel. Yeah, he so, does, he goes huh? to like a coat check kind of thing. Uh, or a luggage check. And he gets a claim, a claim ticket for it. Takes the claim ticket. Sticks it in an envelope. Throws it in a mailbox. Then he gets all of the players to go to his apartment. Yeah. So Wilmer, Cairo, Gutman, Bridget, they all end up at the apartment. And he decides he's going to strike up a deal. So he'll sell the bird. He has the bird. He's in possession. He'll sell it. But they need to come up with a fall guy, a patsy, for the murders. Yeah. Because he's got to get his neck out of the noose, right? So... It could be Wilmer, and he suggests so, and Wilmer's like, well, we could just torture you and find out, you know, and blah, 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 and he's yeah. like, man, that might work, might not work, but we'd be better if you could do it this way. He also suggests Cairo, and Cairo suggests Bridget, and Sam says, eh, it could be Bridget. If you think she'll make a good fall guy, yeah, let's use her. Yeah. Um, at the end of the conversation, Gutman decides that Wilmer will be the, the fall guy. Yeah. And Wilmer... Takes it very hard. Yeah, freaks out. Cries. Cries. Well, so when Sam is accusing him and calling them a gun, a gun cell again, and yeah. he, he, he calls him a lot of names, actually. He calls him, at, at, in this scene, he calls him a pocket desperado, mm. um, which I thought was a clever uh, little jab. He... Um, Wilmer has had enough. 
Oh, he yeah. reaches this breaking point. Um, and I was I was going to talk about this a little bit. Why don't I just go ahead and talk about it now? But um, oh, sorry, I'm just just trying to scroll down to find uh, where my notes are here. That's okay. Um, I. I so basically they they sh- they do a good job of showing how people escalate how right. they, these characters escalate so you know like Cairo is calm and all of a sudden he's he's flips and he's pulling a gun on you and and Wilmer is so mad he desperately wants to shoot Sam he really does right in the face yeah i mean just absolutely wants to shoot Sam and in this moment in the room when he's you know convincing Gutman to sell out his man yeah he has this not quite blank look, but it's not calm, but it's this look where all he can see is rage. Yeah. And he's so infuriated that he starts just tears start to slowly come out of his eyes. And I thought it was a really fantastic moment in the film. Yeah. Um, that really showed how desperate some of these people were to hurt each other. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So, um. So Sam says they can make a deal. They need the Patsy, but um. You know, there's this whole. We could torture you, like I said. So. Sam says, "I'll give you the bird if you if you give up your man, Wilmer. I'll give you the bird. I can deliver it in like, by morning. Right. And I want the money. So Gutman says, "Okay, I won't kill you. Yeah." I'll give you ten thousand dollars, and I want that bird. Yeah, and then I want that Maltese Falcon. Gutman spills the beans. Right, and this is a, another. This is a great moment for for Gutman because it's it's like his show at this point. Yeah. So Sam gets to find out what happens. Gutman had his man Wilmer kill Thursby to intimidate Bridget into giving up the bird. Uh huh. Okay. He says that he tried to reason with Thursby. Right. But Thursby was so loyal to Bridget, he wouldn't do it. Oh. He wouldn't double cross her. So, of course, Bridget sort of set some things into motion, thinking that Thursby was going to double cross her. Or she's just flat out lying about everything. She does lie a lot. She does. The dead man in Sam's office carrying the parcel was the captain of the cargo ship that was on fire. Bridget had met him in Turkey. This is this. This captain's name is Jacoby. All right. She met him in Turkey. Um, they were gonna. He was going to bring the bird and give it to her in the United States. Yes. So when he got to the states on the ship, he took the bird, went to her apartment, but uh, Gutman, Wilmer, and Cairo followed him from the ship to her apartment. Yes. And they confronted them. The guy got away. The Jacoby got away, but they fired some shots into him. He, right, he got shot, so he stumbles to Sam's office. He manages to walk all the way to Sam's office with a bullet or two in him. Yep, and a heavy bird and a heavy, heavy, heavy Maltese Falcon. So they get Bridget and they question her, and they find out that she told Jacoby to take the bird to Sam's office. Yeah, she just that that woman is no good. No. So. She's full of lies, that Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Yeah. So the next morning, Effie shows up with the statue, and Gutman just, like, rips up in the package. There's this great moment where they're all kind of crowding around it to look. Yeah. And he takes out a knife because he's going to just verify it and scratch away some of the enamel, and he cuts and he cuts and he cuts, and, of course, it's just lead. Lead. Falcon. Everybody gets mad. Um, he demands the money back from Sam. Sam keeps a 1000 of the 10,000 for his trouble. Yeah. And the crooks leave, leaving Sam and Bridget alone in the room. Sam immediately calls the police to tell them um, where these these men are that are doing this uh, espionage or whatever. Right. Um, at their hotel and where to pick them up and that they killed two people. Yeah. Sam then confronts Bridget. Uh-oh. And she finally confesses to killing Archer. That's true, huh? And she's all, she's all, save me, Sam. Let's run away together. And Sam sort of weighs out the pros and the cons um, out loud. Yeah. He feels like he can't trust her is what he kind of ultimately comes to. And he says, all we've got is maybe, maybe I love you. Right. Maybe you love me. 
and he seems he seems torn over it. Yeah. But he says he loves her, but she manipulated him like everyone else, so he's not going to save her. Right. And she says, well, if the bird was real and we had the money, you would save me. And he says... This is true. Yeah, probably. If there was some, <laughs> you know, if the bird was real, I probably would save you. And I thought, well, I'm like, that's a lot of balls right there. So that's, that's a big, big set of balls to say that. Well... Um, He's Sam Spade. And she says, you know, if you really love me, then the money wouldn't matter. Hmm. So um, the police show up and he, he turns over the money and the bird and the girl. And the last shot we see of her is the police taking her into the elevator and they pull the, the gate closed. Yeah. Kind of mimicking the bars of the jail cell in front of her. Um, and that's the Maltese Falcon. There it is. Or Falcon. I think I'm a falcon guy. Are you? Yeah, not a falcon. I'm a falcon. But not a falcon. Yeah, not quite. Um, this this movie is interesting. Um, I think it's the, the earliest film that I can think of that has a MacGuffin. Yeah? Um, Hitchcock used the MacGuffin quite a bit. Spielberg used the MacGuffin a bit, um, no, notably in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Yeah, um, big time. And for those of you that don't, un, don't know what a MacGuffin is, it's basically... Um, an object that moves the the movie or the story that it's the thing that everybody wants that ultimately is worthless is pointless it doesn't doesn't really mean anything in in terms of the story yeah it's not the real treasure right so the real treasure was knowledge yeah so uh so this is the first fil- film that I can think of that but in, additionally a lot of film historians believe that this is the first film noir as well. Mm. That's so, interesting. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a first in in uh, in many ways. Um, you know, there's these cold, calculated characters working from within the shadows with their knives and their guns, and they kind of have bad attitudes, and oh, yeah. um, they're snarky. Um, and, of course, all this trouble that these men are suffering from is mostly caused by a lying woman. Mm. And that's... that's uh, a very traditional staple of a film noir is that women are the trouble of all of all or the, are the source of all trouble. Oh, great. Not their own greed. Yeah. Just women. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, you know, kind of going along with like the cold characters, um, you know, as a staple of film noir, um, they're hard and they're kind of mean at the end of the day. And yeah. even Sam, who is fairly, Fairly likable in the film um, because he's sort of the hero and you sort of see everything through his eyes. But he's a jerk. He's a bit of a jerk. Yeah. Um, but uh, he so he says this line at the end of the movie that I love. All right. So he basically tells Bridget that he's he's going to give her up, and he says, "If you're good girl, you'll get out in twenty years. Yeah. If they hang you, I'll always remember you." <laughs> and then the police show up and he. I mean that's that's really cold. It's extremely cold. You know, um, if you're a good girl, you'll get out in twenty years. Yeah. If they hang you, I'll always remember ya. So I'm bogey. So again, kind of like talking about Sam and sort of his relationship to women and um, the misdirection that they give us in the film. All right. um, that's another thing I really liked about the film. Um, and it's also another like staple of film noir is this misdirection. Yeah. So you think you know what the character's motivations are. So, so Sam, again, we talked about how he's sort of neutral. He sort of plays this devil's advocate where you're not really hundred percent sure if he's serving his own interests or not. Right. There's this moment when they finally get the, the bird, he and Effie get the bird and he grabs her by the wrist. Yeah. And she's like, you're hurting me. And it's this moment where it's sort of this like nice ruse where Sam is, it's like Sam is interested in the value of this bird. Right. Right. Like, Oh, Sam's he's, he's got a payday now. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was kind of a nice, uh, a nice misdirection, I guess. Uh, do you want to, do you have anything you want to add right now? Cause I've been talking forever, man. Not at the moment. No. I mean, you've, you've definitely hit so many more points that I could ever hit. I took very few notes on this. Movie, yeah. I, I, I must point out. Well, it's hard um, when you when you don't get into a movie as well. It's hard to take a lot of notes. I think, but maybe that's it. Um, so, so just to stay on the whole devil's advocate thing for a little bit longer. Um, yeah, I think what what separates him from being a bad guy 
ultimately is that he has a code. Yeah. Right? He's a dude that'll sleep with his partner's wife, but um, he has a code that is, um, I have to do what's right by the law. Yeah. Um, That's true. So, uh, so it's easy to still kind of root for him throughout yeah. the film. And he's, he's kind of funny and snarky and stuff. So, um, yeah. And it's like, for the most part, he is a good guy, you know, cause he's not, he's never throwing anybody innocent under any buses, right? but virtually everybody he's dealing with in this movie is crooks. Right. And, you know, and fellow jerks. So, yeah. you know, they'd throw him under the bus just as easily. So we talked about at the beginning about how, um, or I, I talked about how I think it's a good film. Yeah. But I think what it gave us is maybe um, a reason why people love this film so much or revere it so much. Yeah. You know, being, you know, probably the first film noir, um, being an early film that has, you know, a really clear MacGuffin. Um, I thought the performances are, are very good in it. Sure. Um, I think there's, you know, the, the theme of the bars yeah. show up, the jail, the jail bars show up frequently. Um, I think, uh, Bridget, when he shows up at her house or apartment, when he finds yeah. out who she is the first time, she's wearing striped pajamas, oh. you know, there's, um, so there's a lot of like, um, really cool, uh, thematic things that they do throughout the film. Um, it's uh, it's probably the movie that made Humphrey Bogart, you know, an icon. Sure. It's a movie that launched John Huston's career. Uh, John Huston did Treasure of Sierra Madre, The African Queen, which I think might be in our bucket. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, Annie. He, you know, like he did Annie in the 80s. He yeah. did Preeti's Honor. So right. he, I mean, he, you know, it, it launched the, a career of this director who, who made some really, really great films. Isn't he also in Chinatown? John Houston in Chinatown? I feel like he is. I don't, I don't know. I've not seen Chinatown, my friend. There's a Houston in Chinatown. Let me double check. You keep talking. So, you know, so this, this great director that we get out of it, who gives us these really cool, this really cool imagery. Um, he, you know, he did some other things like shooting the movie over, Bogey's shoulder, almost the whole movie shot over from that's true from huh? Sam's perspective, um, which is a pretty bold move, especially in that day and age. So, um, so you're looking something up now. I'm pretty much I'm pretty much run through the gamut of what I think about um, uh, the Maltese Falcon. How do you feel about it after having kind of like talked over what the plot is again and sort of hearing some of these um, things? Well, it's. It's a lot, like I said, it's like, if, you know, if I had seen the movie back then, mm -hmm. or even maybe anywhere within the following 20 years, I'd probably appreciate it a lot more. Yeah. But it's just, it's just a matter of, I came to it at the wrong time, mm. where, you know, it's, it's so much, there's the old adage, uh, you know, a play tells you about the action a movie mm -hmm. has to show you the action sure and so had i seen this as a play i'd be like well hey that was a dope play right there seeing it as a movie even though it was made at a time when to show all of that action probably wasn't feasible sure it's just sort of like you, we're star-crossed do you think that's what it is. Me and this movie are star-crossed lovers. If they could have, without slowing down the pacing of the film, because I think the pacing was already slow to begin with, yeah. without slowing down the pacing of the film, if they could have slowed down how you received the information so yeah. you understood a little bit better what was going on, do you think that would have changed how you felt about the movie? Like, I don't even know if it's slowed down so much as just, like, show me some of these... Some yeah. of these scenes that they're talking about, you know? But would you have been okay if it would have been a movie full of flashbacks? Yeah. Really? I think so, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess for a movie like this, I mean, if this movie had, had shown everything, it would be almost all flashbacks. Right, so but, if they had flashbacks, so like if they had done, um, Bridget tells a, tells a story, yeah, and you get a flashback of that, but it's not the truth. What are we as the audience supposed to believe? So do we get a That's second a flashback where right. we see a different version of that and a third flashback where we finally get the truth? You know what I mean? Like, sure. So that's sort of the 
conundrum, I think, about telling a story, A, that's a novel, a detective novel like this. Yeah. Um, and B, you know, we're, we're telling a story from the perspective of Sam, right? Like, we're looking over his shoulder the whole film. So, um, how do you... Uh, how do you make Sam see those things? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, like, like if we're not supposed to learn information until Sam learns it... Yeah. You know, like, I, yeah, I don't know how you do that, but... That's a fair point. But I, I do get what you're saying. There is, there is something that... Um, some clarity that's left out. Hmm. Um, and that's kind of what I was saying about like, sort of like delivering the information in a slower way or something like, and maybe slow is not the right word. Clear. Maybe faster way, a clearer, well, faster. Way. I feel like the dialogue is spoken so quickly that like you miss some of these important things. Like you, you're left trying to piece together what just, ha- what was just said in a scene yeah. after the scene's done. Right. So I wonder if, you know, if maybe it was more clear hmm. if, if it would have been more enjoyable to you, but but I like the movie. Are you glad you saw it? Oh, absolutely! Great. I'm absolutely Fantastic. glad I've seen it. And it's it's one of those movies, uh, you know, that I'm surprised it took me this long to see it. Sure. I think had I watched it, you know, in my 20s or younger, I probably would have never made it through. This mm. brings us to Steve's Coffee Countdown. Yeah. All right. So in the first two movies, dozing off fairly regularly, The Maltese Falcon. Even though I've got my my beef with it. Um, I only dozed off. I just had a really brief nod off about an hour and 35 minutes into the movie. I just kind of, oh, like that, you know, I was just asleep for a second and I woke right up. So it did a great job of holding my attention, which is extremely surprising for a black and white movie and my brain. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, I know I should love it. A lot more, but I just I can't imagine myself watching it again anytime. Yeah, it's okay. You know, I mean, there's a lot of movies out there. Yeah, and you know, you'll love something else that's amazing, and you'll love some stuff that other people hate. Yeah, I, I love Ain't all sorts of stuff that people hate. You know, Ain't that the truth? Um, we should maybe get to Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> yeah, we've been been really talking about. I do you think do you think this is a terrible podcast? This this episode. No, I don't know exactly which time what time we started, so I don't know how long we were just talking about yeah, the Maltese Falcon. Probably about an hour is my guess, but possibly, yeah. Oh, I can look. All right. Oh, you can. All right. So while he looks, I'm going to start yeah, warming totally hour. you guys up. That's not right. That's for... what we did for North by Northwest. Just real I quick. So huh? I want to compare. I want to compare real quick. Um, you didn't love North by Northwest either. Which this of these true. of these two films? Um, both kind of. So one's. A clear film noir. The other is probably a little bit of a spoof of film noir. Yeah. Um, which film did you like better, Maltese Falcon or North by Northwest? I'd have to say North by Northwest because oh, at least see. that is showing me all the action. You fell asleep. And you, you had a higher coffee I did. count on in that one. That's very true, which so, is very strange. Yeah, it's interesting. But uh, Eva Marie Saint. Even recent. So and that beautiful blonde hair. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> do you want to? Do you do you feel uh, confident to uh, take the lead on uh, Sunset Boulevard? Absolutely not. All right, perfect. Because your brain stores information a whole lot differently than my brain does. <laughs> okay. Um, but I'll 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 get us started. Okay. And then feel free to uh, chime in, obviously, because mm-hmm. uh, that's how this show works. Sure. So Sunset Boulevard, 1950, starring. Uh, his name, I'm literally looking at it on the page here. There we go. William Holden mm-hmm. as writer Joe Gillis. Mm-hmm. And Norma, well, Gloria Swanson as Norma Desmond. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about where it starts and where it begins. It's, dir- it's directed by, I just want to point out, directed by Please Billy do. Wilder. Yes. Um, famed director. Did a lot of great stuff. Um, one of my favorite films, Some Like a Hot. Which Ooh, is yeah. in the bucket. It's in the bucket. You have not seen it. And I have um, it on DVD. Can you believe it? Yeah, you, ha- you have it on DVD and you never watched it. Yes. Well, we're going to watch it. Correct. This going to be fantastic. Okay. Maybe we'll draw it from the bucket. We might. We might. Well, when we get to drawing, remind me that there's something about these two particular films that I really want to talk about before we draw. Okay. Uh, right. So go ahead. Sunset Boulevard. What's it so about? So where does it start? It starts off at a swimming pool in somebody's yard. Mm-hmm. In a house, a great big house that we can assume is on Sunset Boulevard. But we don't know that yet. There's a dead body floating in this swimming pool. A bunch of cops and reporters are milling around trying to fish the body out of the water. 
There's a really cool shot of the body basically from the bottom of the pool looking up at the corpse's face. And there's a narrator talking about how all this happened and how all this all got started. So then we take a step back by just a few uh, months, maybe years, I think just months. Mm-hmm. And we meet a writer named Joe Gillis. He's a screenwriter back there in old Hollywood. And what's fun about this movie is that um, they reference old Hollywood a lot and they reference real old Hollywood a mm-hmm. lot. Like they're constantly referencing real actors, real stars, real producers, real studio heads, real directors and all that. So it's kind of fun how this movie, while being an entertaining movie in and of itself, is also mm-hmm. kind of a tour through uh, a version of Hollywood that we will never know again. You yeah. know what I mean? And there's and there's a lot of there's several cameos right. of old Hollywood like what was considered old Hollywood then. Sure. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So. <clears throat> That's a very good point. Um so what happens? So Joe Gillis, here he is. He's a screenwriter. He's way down on his luck. And some tough guys come by to uh, repossess his car. And he owes $290 or they got to repossess his car. Now, he is a pretty smart guy. He tells them that his car is somewhere else when really he's just parked it in a place that they won't think to look. So then he goes, he gets in his car, and he's like, okay, I got to get this money because i can't lose my car and it's a beautiful car i don't even remember i forgot to look up what it is you want to look it up real quick sure since we have to talk about the other car too so the other car is probably the one that's going to come up in the searches oh absolutely but the car he's trying to protect is this big beautiful white you know 1940s something or other it's good it's just gorgeous so he goes to uh he goes to one studio head and he's like hey you know i wrote this movie for you you liked it. I got this new idea about a baseball movie, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, uh, a reader walks into the room. A young Miss uh, Schaefer comes into the room. Because the, you know, what is it? The studio head, he's like, call the reading department, <coughs> ask about this picture. Base is loaded. Yeah, base is loaded. So she comes in, she's like, well, base is loaded, blah, blah, blah. It's no good. And then the producer's like, well, you might want to meet uh, Joe Gillis. He's standing right behind you. So this is their meet cute, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. She meets the guy who just wrote this movie that she called No Good, and he takes it pretty hard. But that's barely of any consequence right now because Joe needs 300 bucks. He asks the producer if he can borrow 300 bucks as a personal loan. The producer explains a funny little, uh, a funny little bit about how, you know, last year I bought a ranch up in the valley. This year I had to mortgage the ranch so I could keep paying my life insurance so I could blah, blah, blah. Just talks about how pretty much everybody is, you know, in debt in one form or another mm-hmm. in this town. Uh, so then Joe goes to Schwab's, the famous Schwab's drugstore, mm-hmm. which uh, if you want to hear a really great story about Schwab's, listen to the most recent episode of I Was There Too by Matt Gorley. Great, great other podcast. I'll mm-hmm. throw that in because I don't want to tell the story because it's their story. Listen to that great story about Schwab's drugstore and how it was really kind of this uh, Joe Gillis in this movie refers to it as headquarters because apparently it really was legendary for being a place where just all of Hollywood was going to happen in and out of at some point every day. Place to be seen. A place to be seen and to do some seeing. So that was pretty darn cool. So he goes into Schwab's drugstore. Can't get any help in there. Long story short, he winds up on the run from these repossession guys. They spot him while he's out driving this car that they're trying to repossess. He manages to go tearing. I was about to swear, Wes. I'm sorry. I guess we can swear. You can swear. He goes tearing ass down Sunset Boulevard. Now, back then, Sunset Boulevard wasn't the overclogged, you know, thoroughfare that it is today. So he's driving along. He gets away from them pretty nicely, puts some angles between him and them. They can't see him, but then he pops a tire manages to turn up into a driveway before they see him. So he rolls deep into the driveway. He turns around. He sees them whiz on past. They don't even look at him. And then he's in the driveway of this old, gigantic house. I mean, it's a palace. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what was it? Uh, 10, 10,086 Sunset Boulevard, right? Something like that. Pretty sure that was the address he gave. It's this great big palace built on, he says uh, something about old Hollywood. So he's talking about now, he's talking about silent picture stars and how they were just making money hand over fist. And 
So he literally just rolls his car, flat tire and all, into an empty garage in this probably six-car garage, pulls it into one of the stalls, and goes up to the house to see if he can find any help for repairing his tire. Um, and then what happens? Uh, he meets Max, the butler, yep. who's a very mi- mysterious fellow with a German accent. Well, he's called in by someone in the house, a woman in the house, sees him from a window. That's and says, true. I've been waiting for you. Yeah. Get in. And then Max, then we see Max at the door, and Max says, this way. Yes, and then Max says something about, um, if you need any help with the coffin, call for me, or something like yeah. that. And we're all like, okay, so what is this? So now here is Ryder, down on his luck, pockets turned out, empty, broke, lives in a tiny apartment, Joe Gillis, and he stepped into this old, dusty palace off Sunset Boulevard, and it might be the answer to his every prayer. Hmm. It's probably not. So, So he goes upstairs. Yes. And he finds a corpse. But before he finds a corpse, he meets a nice lady. Mm. Mm. Is she a nice lady? She's not very nice at all. Mm-mm. He meets a lady, an older, an older lady. Does he find out who she is right away? No. Okay. Not till after he realizes the corpse. Yeah. And she's talking about this, that, and the other thing. This corpse is it? Is it? Is it okay to bury him in my backyard? This sort of thing. And then this hand falls out from under a blanket. It's hairy. And it's kind of a funny, hairy-looking hand. And she peels back the blanket, and it's the corpse of a chimpanzee. And poor, super rich lady who lives, you know, what's the word, cordoned away from everybody else, has lost her pet chimpanzee. So I can understand that she's in a bad mood. Can I can I tell you a story about the... Please uh, do. Tell that story while I itch my ear. Um, so Billy Wilder, the director, was is was well known for... Being asked questions and giving crazy answers. All right. So there's a story that Nancy Reagan... Nancy Reagan. ...asked him about the chimpanzee. We're talking about the wife of President Ronald Reagan. Correct. Two-term First Lady of the United States. Yep. All right. So she asked him what was up with the the monkey, and um, he responded, well, of course... Norma, okay, pardon my language, Norma was fucking the monkey. <laughs> oh, no. Why, Billy Wilder? Uh, Why? That is the only answer that we have regarding what was up with the monkey. Wow. That's wild. See, because I feel like you and I, having grown up in the Michael Jackson era, mm-hmm. where Michael famously had a pet chimpanzee named Bubbles. Doesn't seem weird. Doesn't seem weird. Mm-hmm. We're just like, oh, it was a rich person, yeah. a rich, talented, famous person. If I could afford a pet chimp, I would. Why yeah. shouldn't Norma afford a pet chimp? So that brings us to Joe learns who this woman is. Yep. She is 51-ish year old, former silent movie star seems like an understatement. Silent movie icon. icon. Silent movie supernova. Yeah. Norma Desmond, played by the beautiful... Gloria Swanson. Now, wasn't Gloria Swanson also in Titanic in 1997? Was that her? I don't know. Did she play the older version of Rose? Was that Gloria Swanson? Oh, that might have been Gloria Swanson, yeah. That's When I hear the name Gloria Swanson, that's where my brain goes. I'll look it up. But either way, so now here she is. It's 1950. She was Norma Desmond, you know, 19, 20-year-old screen icon and all these silent pictures. She made so much money. She built this great, big, beautiful house. This, that, and the other thing. Now, she's a 50-ish year old woman in the age of the talking films, talkies. And she thinks talkies are BS. And she's convinced that the world still believes she's a star. She goes on and on and on about all this fan mail that she gets every day. She's got pictures and portraits of herself all over the house. Um, sort of, she sort of turned this house into like a museum to herself. A shrine. A shrine, and she is its most favorite tour guide. Real quick, that was Gloria Stewart in Titanic. Gloria Stewart. Gloria Swanson's Gloria Stewart. last film was Airport 75, I believe. Oh. Um, but, uh, so when he realizes that she's Norma Desmond. Right. We get a fantastic line from her. One of 
many. Oh, should yes. we save all the lines for the end of this thing, or should we talk about them throughout? Uh, let's go on throughout. You okay. Know? Again, these are movies that people should have seen. Yeah. And we just have not. And this is considered again by F on one of AFI's lists on a, a whole bunch of magazine lists as yeah. one of the one of the um top lines in movie history. Can I give Joe's lead in line? Sure. So if Joe says something like Norma Desmond, uh you were a big movie star. And she say he says, You used to be big. You used to be big. And she says I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Booyah. I mean, she doesn't say booyah. It's a, yeah, booyah is not included. Uh, it, it's a, an exciting line, and it's it's the first time we get sass out of her. And this is a lady <laughs> who is, like, 97% of her is sass. Ooh, I would dare to say 99.9. Okay. Sure. I mean, most of her is, she's a sassy lady. Yeah. Full of... Uh, um, Pith and vinegar? Well, I was going to say she's full of, like... Herself? Stature and... Yeah. Bravado? Uh, bravado, yeah. She's just so full of this, like, drama. Yeah, she is Everything on she says, all the time. And the way she... She smiles. <laughs> she, she... She... The entire time, she has sort of the same, like, grin plastered to her face. And it is a... Combination smile and sneer. I would say, and it's hauntingly beautiful. To be honest, yeah, I, um, I would say like like um, imagine Cruella Deville's face, and then just like you know, nicen it up a bit. Yeah, pretty it up a little. Yeah, um, and she speaks mostly through her teeth, with her teeth clenched yes. almost the entire film, and it's. Again, kind of just to harken back to our last podcast. Yeah. Do you remember what I said right before we started watching Sunset Boulevard? No. I said, I'm having a Sophie's Choice moment. Oh, that's right. I don't want to watch this movie. And then I clicked play. Right. And I loved the movie. It's right. a two, two times in a row. Our second film has been a movie I did not want to see. And I really love the film. And I love the movie because of Gloria Swanson's performance. I, oh, yeah. I... I Wanted to, I wanted her constantly on screen. I wanted yeah. to just watch her and watch her mouth say words without moving. <laughs> it, was like, it was it was amazing. I do agree. Yeah, I'm I'm very glad we finally got through this. I I've tried to watch this movie recently um, because I keep seeing people talk about how good it is, and I'm like, I know I need to see that. I know I need to see that. And I picked the wrong night to try to watch it because I wound up falling asleep like 10 minutes in. And let me tell you, if you fall asleep 10 minutes into this movie, that's the absolute worst time. So just stick with it. Have some coffee. Write it out. Okay, so he finds out who she is. She's got this play, this ornate place that's a, a, a shrine dedicated to her. I'm sorry. Yeah. I interrupted oh, that's okay. our, our dialogue, our line dialogue. No, that's how this thing works, baby. Um, so then what happened? Oh, so, so then, uh, you know, Joe's about to leave... I'm not sure how he planned to leave with his car with the flat tire, but yeah. he's he's fixing to just walk right out. And then Norma Desmond is like, oh, you're a writer, you say, blah, blah, blah. And so she brings him into the house and um, well, further into the house and <clears throat> she lays a script on him, which is basically it looks like about 12 big bundles of paper handwritten heaped up on a desk, heaped up on a desk. And it's a script for. Salome, or as she pr- pronounces it, Salome, um, which I'm not sure if that is a joke or what, but uh, yeah. as far as I know, the, the 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 script is Salome, which is a story, a pretty famous story. Can I tell you my Salome story? Real it's an fast? opera. But it's yes, an opera. Uh, Oscar Wilde, I think, wrote a version of it. Mm. Easter Sunday, 2005. Mm-hmm. No, 2006. Um, I accompanied. A very young, lovely young lady to a performance of Salome over in Westwood at the Veterans Center. I forget something like that. Uh, stood in line behind Damon Wayans and his father. Wow, which was just insane to me. I'm like, whoa, there's Damon Wayans, and this was a staged reading of Salome, produced by and starring Al Pacino. Wow. So I'm in the same room watching Al Pacino read from a book with Damon Wayans. Well, he was in the audience too. Yes. Yeah, but you so I'm room. in the same room with Damon yeah. Wayans. There you have it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, performing the role of Salome and doing all these wild dances and pretty much off book completely. Almost everybody else was on book, 
And there was a note in the program about how it's supposed to be on book. You know, this is meant to be read and not memorized and perform that sort of thing. Do what you want with that information, folks. But performing as Salome, mm-hmm. doing these wildly beautiful dances, having pretty much all of her lines memorized, calling for the head of John the Baptist when she's disappointed by his, uh, you know, predictions or whatever, was current. Back then, never heard of her in my life. Now she's already Oscar winner Jessica Chastain. Wow, really? And back then she was just, she's doing a great job as Salome. Fantastic. Hope it works out for her. And she's already Oscar winner Jessica Chastain. Wow, Is that amazing. incredible or yeah, what? That's incredible. So Norma wants Joe to help her, basically to help her turn her handwritten Salome into a script. She's not really keen on the idea of editing out anything that she's written. You almost get the feeling she wants him to just type it and then... Yeah, yeah. it seems like she really wants to just pay him to type it. (laughs) And she keeps talking about how money is no object and this and that. Um, You know, as things go on, she's basically, she insists that he stays at the house I think it's like by the next day, everything from his apartment has been brought to the house. It's in the room and he freaks out. He's like, what? what? Yeah, like he wakes up and it's all just in his room, I think. Or maybe yeah. he comes back into his room for something and just all of his belongings are there. Norma's basically buying him out of his old life, paying off his debts, this, that, and the other thing. Although, except for the car, she, she the car. doesn't seem to pay for the car. Should we jump to that or is there... Um, I think we can jump. That, I think okay. we can jump a little bit. So we find out she doesn't seem to pay for the car because one night... Joe calls them the uh, the waxworks, right? These old, well, let's say older, silent film stars come by to play bridge with Norma Desmond. And at the table, we definitely see, now his name is Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton is there, and he has a f- one funny line. Yeah. And then, um, and who are the other two? Do we know who the other two I are? I don't know who the other two are. Neither do I. Curses. That's okay. You look that up. I'll tell this story. Um, I, so they're playing bridge around the uh, around the table, and and Joe's just sitting there, not even in the game at all. And he looks over at the front door, and he can see Max, the creepy butler, talking to the two repossession men at the front door. Mm-hmm. And so the first thing that goes through Joe's head is sort of like, "Well, what the heck? Hasn't Norma paid off everything? Why are these guys here looking for my car?" What goes through my head is, how on earth would they have any idea to drive up this this uh, part, you know, this driveway in the middle of nowhere that they chased him by once, however many weeks ago? How would they find the car there? I don't know. But anyway, so Joe goes to Norma while she while she's at the table with her friends. He's like, "I need some money. I got to get some money. These guys are going to tow my car. You got to give me some money." Norma blows him off. So Joe goes running outside. To watch as these guys tow his beautiful car away. And it's heartbreaking, as far as I'm concerned. Um, So then Joe's standing there. He watches as they tow away his beautiful car. Norma joins him out there on the, uh, I guess that's a veranda. I'm not sure what you'd call it. Maybe it's a terrace. And she's just like, ah, the car, big deal. I've got a car. You don't need your car. This, that, and the other thing. And basically, in a way, Joe is kind of officially trapped here now because even though his car wasn't working at all i feel like he at least had the knowledge of okay i've got a car in there maybe if i can escape long enough to find a spare tire i can put it on and get the heck out of here someday and now it's like nope there goes my car you know he says to her like you know you might as well cut off my legs or something like that yeah and uh now joe is like officially stuck yeah in this big, beautiful palace with this, you know, alarmingly rich woman that he just plain is not in love with. And then what happens? Uh, well, I was looking up. I was looking up IMDb. Oh, so yeah. So who else right was um, at that bridge table? So it's hard to tell exactly who was at the table. I think Anna Nilsson was at the table. She was a silent film star. Okay. H.B. Warner might have been at that table. He cool. was also a film silent film star. It's interesting because there's a lot of people that played themselves. Yeah. Ray Evans, Cecil B. DeMille. Um, oh, man. The Cecil B. DeMille scene. Hedda Hopper, who was a, a kind of a... I don't want to say she was a tabloid person. Okay. Because um, they didn't really have tabloids back then, per se. But she was like a page six kind of writer. Okay. Um, and uh, and she is at the end of the film, but we'll we'll cover that in a little oh, bit. Oh, all right. Um, That's very good to know. I'm trying to think who else played themselves. Ray Evans, Jay Livingston. So there's a lot of people that played 
themselves in the film. Yeah. Which I'm trying to figure out exactly where the movie goes after the car towing. Because that's not New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve is the dance party. Yeah, I mean, we can we can probably move on to, to like, New Year's Eve, you know, for, yeah. for sake of the plot. I mean, um, it goes to them, um, like, he's getting... He becomes more of a kept, a right. kept man. She starts buying clothes for him. So right. she, she they, has they the take pool a ride. They take cleaned and refurbished yep. and whatnot. Yep. Um, so they take a ride in in the other car. Yes, that's kind of where this goes. And they go. She gets him a, a blue blue flannel suit. Yeah, yeah. Um, a tux with tails. Right. <laughs> specifically for New Year's. Um, and just a, a host of other things. Cigarette case um that yeah, she inscribed huge and a light, like a gold lighter and uh a whole bunch of things yeah um so we can we could probably jump to new year's new year's eve because i think that's probably the next major I, I think it has to be right um yeah yeah all right so new year's eve rolls around uh joe's getting his tuxedo put on uh getting ready for this new year's eve party that uh that norma's hosting and he goes downstairs to the grand ballroom in the house for this party. And Norma is dancing by herself in the middle of the dance floor. There is a little uh, band playing in the corner. There's Max the uh, butler standing behind a table with an absolutely beautiful cake on it. And there is no one else at all at this party. No band. The band. The I band. said the band. Yeah. yeah, just the band. Yeah, so there's just the band, Max the butler, Norma, and Joe. That's it. Who knows how many hundreds of dollars she spent on this party. It's just a New Year's Eve party for her and Joe, and it's sad. It made me so sad. So they start dancing around. The band is playing some lovely music. Well, they show this... this there's this really interesting high angle shot in that in that oh, yeah? scene too, um, when they show them dancing. Um, it's like this is the room that she forces him to work in, and all this, right? Um, and she's completely that she forces. They watch movies, right? In there of her, in there. Yeah, they screen her old silent movies. Um, and the it's completely surrounded with her image right and there's this really interesting shot where it's like this dance floor is empty with the exception of them in the middle of it yeah just completely the everything surrounding is completely covered in her and flowers and it's like this um he is completely trapped yeah it's it's this moment where you you finally realize like this guy is at his limit and he is stuck and he realizes that in the scene as well um, because what happens after the dancing on New Year's is very, very important. Yeah. he uh, Joe sneaks out. He Well, she confronts him and says... What does she say? She says, she, I, she I'm in love him? with you. She does tell him that there. She okay. tells him. I felt like that came a little later, but no. that's just me. And and he sort of breaks her heart. Yeah. Right? Um, and, uh, and so he leaves. He's like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta be around people that... I gotta get away from all of this clutter yeah. and this mess, and I gotta be around people that are my own age and people right. that I can really talk to and, and just enjoy their company. Yeah, and I feel like he also sort of mentions like he wants to be around people that are like still kind of on the grind and still struggling. Right. Whereas Norma is filthy rich. She she talks about how she's got oil wells in Bakersfield. She owns this, that, and the other thing. She made all this money on her movies, so she's literally just kind of. Like just decaying, and they allude to that. Wealth. They yeah. allude to that earlier in the film he, when he goes, um, when he's trying to re- borrow money from people. He goes and sees his agent on the golf course. Yes, and his agent says, "Lose your car. It's good for you because you write your best stuff when you're hungry." Right, right. And, and then Joe, and then insults him, and I yeah, think and and, and then, <laughs> and then, yeah, well, yeah, and then he, and then he ends up with Norma, and yeah. everything is taken care of. And they're writing garbage, basically. Right. I mean, this, that's very this, true. This overwrought thing that she won't let him edit, right? You know, and it's all about her and her, you know, just worshiping herself. I mm-hmm. guess you could say. So Joe steals Norma's. Mm-mm. No, no, he he hitchhikes in the rain. That's right, he does hitchhike in the rain. He, he hitchhikes in the rain in his later. in his camel hair coat. 
Yeah, he puts on this nice camel hair coat over his tux. He goes hitchhiking in the rain down Sunset Boulevard. And he winds up at the home of his friend Artie, played by... Jack Webb. Jack Webb of Dragnet. Mm. Detective Joe Friday. But, but Very young Jack <laughs> Webb. I almost didn't recognize him at all. Yeah, I didn't recognize him. Until, until you were like detective and I was like trying to name detectives. And then I was like, oh! Yeah, because I was Friday. looking at his face and I'm like, that face... We've seen that face. Yeah. But he was so young, though. So oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, but at the party, he, he sees somebody that well, we've seen Well, Artie's before. girlfriend. Artie's girlfriend, who is? Miss Schaefer, the one who insulted Joe's script at the beginning of the movie in the producer's office. Mm-hmm. Um, what the heck was her first name? Betty Schaefer? Betty Schaefer. It was Betty. Betty almost seems too simple. But the lovely Betty Schaefer... Uh, girlfriend or fiance of his best friend Artie? I uh, want to say fiance by the girlfriend way. at that moment. Oh, okay. And then later she reveals that they're engaged. okay. So at this point in the story, she's the girlfriend of his very good friend Artie, and Artie's just like Joe even says later in the movie, like Artie's the nicest guy in the world. And it's indicated as soon as Joe shows up, Artie's just like, oh wow, it's so great to see you. weren't expecting to see you. Let me know if you need to crash here for the night. Like, you know, we'll make room, this, that, and the other thing. Like, Artie is just such a nice guy. He's an assistant director. He's, you know, just so happy to be working and happy to have friends. And he's, he's, he's the nicest guy as you, could, as you could ever want to meet. And then what happens, Joe and his girlfriend, Betty, kind of start making eyes at each other as the party goes They get on. close. That's they true. get way Their close. faces get too close. They go into the bathroom to have a conversation about Joe's, one of Joe's scripts that she's read. And Artie even kind of calls him on it. He's sort of like, whoa, Joe, I said you could have my drinks. I didn't say you could have my girl. And Joe's like, oh, or no, Betty's like, oh, we're just going in to talk business. Uh, But, uh, you know, more than business gets discussed. And there are, I just want to point out, there are two two of the most distractingly uh, adorable extras. Oh, right, right, right. In in that scene, talking on the phone and giggling. Right. I don't know what they were listening to on the phone, but I had a uh, good time watching them giggle over Yeah, these two blonde girls that are just holding the phone to their ear and giggling like crazy and occasionally saying uh, something or other. Uh, It's, I don't know what could be so funny on a telephone back then. Yeah. It was definitely, you know, pre-Jerky Boys, but uh, no, I'm kidding. But, um, yeah, so that was strange. So then Joe and, and Betty are in the they're in the uh, bathroom talking, and the door's open, you know, nothing, everything's above board, but they start trading these lines back and forth from, like, romantic movies or plays or something like that. And it, it seems like they're, they're throwing really scripted lines at each other, and all of them are just very romantically slanted. And then the two girls come in, and they're like, the telephone's free, <laughs> and they run off, and Joe goes to use the phone. And I don't even remember who he's trying to call. I think he calls back to the He calls to, the to tell Max to pack up his things. That's right. He tells Max, Max, pack up my things, have them taken back to my apartment, blah, blah, blah. Max, very stern on the other side of the phone, is just like, I can't do that. Norma cut her wrists. Mm-hmm. So Joe runs out of the party, gets into a taxi cab, goes tearing down Sunset Boulevard, finds Norma in bed, Bandages all around her wrist. The doctor is just leaving. And, uh... He has to make a very difficult decision. Yeah. Joe is just feeling guilty as heck. Should he be feeling guilty? I mean... The thing about about Joe is that he's a con man. He is. And, and not, not a hardcore con man. He's not like a flim-flam guy that's right. constantly looking for a mark. He stumbled into a situation, and he acknowledges it in the voiceover right. that he he was going to use it to his advantage, um, and that he he positioned himself with a place to stay, right? So he could be away from the guys that were looking for the car. Um, but so I think so I think he's he should feel some guilt because he sort of has led her on, not yeah. necessarily in a romantic way, but um, you know. He put himself in. He put himself in this situation. That's sure. true. That is true. So he makes the decision. He he uh, goes in and kisses her, and really becomes a kept man at yeah. that point. Essentially, a live-in gigolo. Yeah, I guess you could say. And um, gosh, where does it go from there? Okay, so well, Joe—they f- they finish their script. 
That's right. Salome. They finish writing Salome, and they have uh, they have Max take it in in the big beautiful car. They have him take it to Paramount Pictures and deliver it to s- director Cecil B. DeMille. Do you go with Cecil or Cecil? Cecil, I think. I always want to say Cecil too. So they have Max deliver it to Paramount Pictures straight into the hands of director Cecil B. DeMille who is Norma's favorite director, and she goes on and on about how much money they made together and this, <laughs> yeah. that, and the other thing. And gosh, then where does it go? So Max takes the script to the yes. studio, and then they start getting phone calls from the studio. That's right, the phone calls start. And she's like, is it is it Cecil? Yeah. And they're like, no, it's this other guy, and is this Cole, something Cole. Yeah, something uh, Greg, George Cole. I want to say Gary Cole, like, but that, no, that's not right. right. It's not George um, Somebody named Cole. So he, uh, she says, you know, he's trying to get my number down. He, you know, he wants me. He wants the script, but he he wants to get my number down. So she says, I'll only talk to him. And yeah. then they get phone call after phone call, or they allude to that they get phone call after phone call. So they decide to take the car eventually and go to the studio. Right. To my favorite scene of the entire film. The Jonesy scene? Or the scene, everything, just the whole scene at the studio. The scene in the, in the, in the soundstage. Yeah. With Norma. All right. And here, speaking of Jonesy, because this is kind of the, the, the sort of sad line that Norma's walking. So they pull in to Paramount Pictures, right? Mm-hmm. Right there on Melrose Boulevard. And here's Norma, this very affluently dressed lady in this gorgeous car that at this point is from what 1932 so like this beautiful classic car Mm -hmm. and there's a kind of young security guy at the gate and he's just like oh you don't have an appointment you can't get on the lot today blah 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 giving her a hard time and then she spots jonesy in the security booth and jonesy is a much older guy i'd say easily into his high 60s and she's like jonesy jonesy dear and he's like oh gee whiz norma desmond and he comes out and he's like Norma Desmond gets on the lot. She doesn't need a pass. Blah blah blah. They open the doors for her, and she says something interesting to that young, uh, the young guard. Yeah, and she says, "Without me, there wouldn't be a Paramount Pictures." Right, and it's true because um, Gloria Swanson was like the top star of Paramount Pictures for for years. Right. So yeah. in in a way, like that was sort of like art imitating life. Yeah, it's the you know, for the most part, it's the stars it's the faces of the stars that put the butts in the seat mm-hmm. it's a strange strange how that works yeah but um they let him on they let him on and then you know she makes her way onto the set and there's there's still kind of this vibe of like young people have no idea who she is and these are the people who are making decisions now but then there's a lot of elderly people around the set that practically worship her right so well she so she tells cecil yes uh you know i've i've, I've received your calls yeah and he's like calls uh, right cecil yeah, B. Yeah, yeah, does yeah. not know that anybody's been calling norma desmond so house. he says you sit here in my chair and i'll go make some and you go check on some things yeah. so he goes and calls this coal guy yeah and the coal guy says we we actually saw her car yes her butler drove the car on set and it's exactly perfect for the crosby picture yeah that's what it is is we we want to rent the car they don't want her they don't want her they want her car but while he's gone that's when all the older people see her they're like yes is that norma desmond i thought she was dead and right. all this stuff there's the bit with hawkeye Hog eye, hog eye. oh it is hog eye i thought they were just pronouncing it funny no yeah no hog right, so- guy so Norma's, let's let's start with, okay, so Cecil B. DeMille is like, Norma, wait right here in my chair, his directing chair. Yeah. He's like, wait right here in my chair, we'll take care of everything. And she's sitting here and you hear this voice from nowhere being like, ah, oh, gee whiz, Norma Desmond. And way up on a catwalk is a much older guy with a great big spotlight. And he's like, it's me, Hog Eye. And she's like, oh, Hog Eye, lovely to see you. And he turns this gigantic spotlight, which could not have been comfortable to have blasted straight at you. Yeah. Turns it right onto her, and she's sitting there, and there's this beautiful 
shadow being cast on the floor behind mm-hmm. her and she's just like fully basking in the glory of this moment like yeah. here i am i'm back at paramount pictures the spotlight's on me let's run with it and then everybody just they recognize her all the older people recognize her and she gets completely um encompassed in people yeah she's got this is like her moment it's exactly what she used to experience when she was younger right so she gets all these people around her and it's like the reemergence, or at least you sort of think it's the reemergence of norma desmond right like this could be it she could be back and of course demille has found out that they don't want her and he knows that she was difficult to work with in her later years right and he doesn't want to do her movie right her salome um, and so he comes back and he utters my favorite line of the film. Yes. And he says, Hogeye, put that light where it belongs. Right. And Hogeye moves the light away. And it was like, like I almost get chills, you know? It's like, yeah. it was such a telling line for the film. And it kind of put Norma, and like, of course, everybody disperses and goes back to their places. And it kind of put Norma back in her place, you know? Like, she had this, like, moment in the sun for this, for like a minute. Yeah. And then it was like, you you are not the thing that we revolve around. Right. Um, right. So that was uh, that was such a great moment for me. Um, and, and we should note that it, it really is Cecil B. DeMille playing yeah, Cecil B. DeMille. That was excellent. So... And as far as I'm concerned, one of my favorite performances in the yeah. in the movie, like he was just like, I don't even know if I could if I could uh, if I could do it justice by describing it. But I just remember thinking, like, for a director, that guy's got some great acting chops. Sure, and he, you know he uh, he did the movie for ten thousand dollars and a new Cadillac. Wow! And uh, later on, they realized they needed to get a, a close up of him that they didn't okay. get. Uh, so he charges him another ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty darn funny. So then what happens? Oh, so then while all of this is going on, Joe has snuck off to the uh, the writers' department, and he runs into Betty Schaefer again. Um, and uh, what's going on while he's up there talking to her? Well, she says, "I I went through one of your scripts. Yes, the one we talked about in the bathroom, the dark windows, right? I, yep. And I think we can." I think we can take some stuff out, cut a bunch of things out, and make it about teachers. And it's this really great story, and we could do it, you and me. Yeah. And he's like, no. Yeah, yeah. Joe is literally like, I give it to you. Run with it. You've got this idea. Go for it. Take it. It's fine. Go for it. Um, and meanwhile, Max is outside beeping the car horn like crazy, trying to get Joe's attention. And Betty's like, oh, but I'm really not that good. I'd need you to help me write it, blah, blah, blah. I'm just a girl. Yeah, yeah, that's what was being said in the movie. Um, <clears throat> so we leave that hanging. Joe runs back downstairs, and Max is like, you know, he's like, ah, oh, we found out that the reason we've been getting calls from the studio is because they want the car. They don't want Miss Desmond. They want the car. We already know this, the audience, but Max and Joe are now finding out and it's a much bigger deal because they are both they are both now essentially in the business of protecting her ego. You know, she's paying both of them to basically be sycophants and protect her ego and make her feel like the star that she used to be. So, I don't even remember how they get out of there. How do they get out of there? Out of the studio? Yeah. Does she the, comes, the mill escorts her back to the car and okay. she does this whole like... He's going to make it his next picture after yeah. this one. You know, like, she's completely deluded. Yeah. Um, completely. We never heard anything to imply that DeMille is going to make this movie. Right. Um, so, yeah. And I mean, then as they drive off, uh, DeMille says, like, call up Cole. Uh, tell him to forget about the car. Tell him I'll buy him five cars if I need to. Like, he's... Don't, De- don't let her back on set, basically. Well, yeah, but also, like, DeMille himself is even, like... Trying to protect her ego. Oh, because sure. Because he knows that if she ever finds out it's about yeah. the car, that might very It'll well be... snap. Yeah. That, that'll that be the straw that, that breaks her back. Um, so, yeah. And so, DeMille, it's kind of a very romantic bit. It's like, oh, my gosh, there's this woman that, I, that he, you know, made into a star, but certainly benefited from greatly. And so he is also very protective of her ego and just sort of like, just forget the car. Never mention the car. I'll take care of the car. Screw it. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a very sad but very kind of loving moment. Sure. In a mixed up way. Yeah. Gosh, where does it go from there? So so the crux of this is that um they're done writing, but he stays a kept man. With right. Norma. Um and he at this point in this in the story knows that Max is the one who's writing her yes, pen letters. But also Norma starts her uh her beauty, beauty regiment. regiment. Yes. Yeah, so she's all she pays for all these people to come in and she's doing everything she possibly can. It's she all this crazy all stuff. All these deranged like steam bag and experiments and, and yeah. Yeah, wild stuff. Yeah. So doing all this just desperate stuff to stay relevant yeah. and to be ready to try to get herself looking as young as she possibly can for for DeMille. Um and uh What's his name? Uh, Joe. 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 Um, he decides to secretly go out at night and write with Betty. Yes, with and, Betty. And go ahead and and they they spend their nights on the uh, Paramount lot, right, in her office, and and walking around the lot together and making eyes at each other, whipping apples into the distance. And that's no when he when he finds out that she's engaged. Yes, to Artie. To Artie. Nicest guy in the world. Who's shooting a Western in Arizona. And, uh, but over the course of this time, he, Joe gets his, um, identity back through this. Like, he becomes a writer again and loves what he's doing and he finds somebody that he loves doing it with. And she's like the sort of antithesis of, of Norma. Right. Um, There's a phone call scene that comes up in just a little bit, but there, you know. Um, Betty calls on a black phone and Norma answers, on, or well, Norma calls Betty. Oh, that's right. From a white phone, and Betty is answering on a on a black phone, and yeah. clearly the black phone's like kind of just the standard run of the mill, and the white phone's is like really nice, beautiful white phone. It really shows the difference between the two of them. Yeah. And of course, Max's phone, the servant, is yeah. one of those old like candlestick phones that you have to hold the piece to your ear and then right. hold the, the mouthpiece in front of you. Um, so just sort of like candlesticks. Yeah, I mean that's what it looks like. I mean, I, I don't All know right. what it's really called, but I like that term. Um, so she, so Betty's sort of like the exact opposite of yeah. of Norma. And well, she's gives... young. She's not filthy rich and just wallowing in her own decadence. She, she really is on the verge of great something great, right. probably. Right. Um, but I think more importantly, for the sake of the story, she is the thing or the person, I shouldn't say thing, the person that gives Joe his identity back. Right. Norma takes his identity away. Correct. Betty get, gives it back to him and, and appreciates him and loves him. Um, and so they, of course, they have a lot of near misses. Right. There's even that moment... Um... I think it's a little later in the writing process Mm -hmm. where, uh, oh, she's telling him about, oh yeah, well, when I was a kid, you know, I was, I was, she was born into Hollywood. Her nose. And she talks about, yeah, when she was a little kid, she was taking all these acting classes and stuff, but her nose was like bent way off to the, to the right. And so her parents paid, what was it? They said like $300 or something for a nose job to give her this pretty nose. And then Joe says something like, uh, well, like, do you mind if I kiss you on your pretty nose now? And he does. He kisses her on the bridge of the nose. And then, like, for a second, it's just like, oh, these two are about to tear each other's clothes yeah. off. Yeah, it's like, do it! <laughs> yeah, and then Joe very nobly says, like, I think if we're going to get anything done, we have to agree to stay at least two, two feet, feet away apart. from each other. Yeah. Because, like, any... Oh, well, first, right, at, right when he kisses her nose, he says something like... uh like, may I tell you how nice you smell? Or something like that. It's a very strange line. Yeah. But it's like... And you she know, says, oh, it's, it's my shampoo, I Yeah, think. but it's clearly like... He this says, is no, just him not, looking... No shampoo. For, yeah, this is him looking for any excuse to take a step forward. And so he comes up with this goofy, may I tell you how nice you smell line. And I yeah. thought that was great. Yeah. And then that's when he says, like, okay, we got to stay two feet apart. And I thought that was great because it's like, you know, he's he's looking out for Artie. He's looking out for their working relationship. And I think he also probably knows that if he and Betty were to get down and Norma found out about it. Hell to pay. Hell to pay. Or she might just tell Max to just kill him on the spot. 
You never know. Or she might kill herself. She might kill herself. She might kill him. Like, it's just... So it's like he knows that by avoiding this instant gratification with this beautiful woman that he's mm-hmm. falling in love with, he's really sparing himself a whole lot of trouble. Yeah. And so then is it that night that when he drives home, Max he is finds waiting Max for waiting? Yes. Yeah, and, and they do this a few times in the movie, especially at Norma's house. The lighting is so film noir. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what I'm going to get to a little bit later with the movies we pick. I'll just, I'll just talk about it now. Um both movies we picked were film noirs, really. Um, the women are the cause of the trouble, um, for the most part. And um, they are manipulative, uh, conniving, and you know lead to death and destruction around yeah. them. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting that the bucket pulled to... <laughs> To the bucket, the the bucket gods. Our bucket, yeah, our bucket oh, yeah. gave us two two film noirs um, for the same podcast. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, but the uh, the lighting in Norma's house is is there's this harsh fall off. So like when when he gets home and sees Max in the garage, yeah, ha- only half of Max can be seen. Yeah, um, only half of his face. Really. Yeah, like, I mean it's it's really beautiful. Yeah, and they do it a, several times in Norma's house. Her house is in so many ways dark. It's this big house. There's plenty of lighting, um, but uh, they found a way to kind of make it this brooding yeah. environment. Like a cave. Yeah, almost like a cave. Like a big, beautiful hell cave. Yeah. Um, even even like that first night that he stays there, he looks out, and yeah. they're like burying the the chimp oh that's right yeah and they're they're like out there by candlelight they've got like a candelabra yeah um poor chimp did they ever name the chimp i don't think they ever did that makes me even more sad we'll call it reagan reagan the chimp (laughs) (laughs) so joe pulls into the garage Mm -hmm. in the middle of the night after being out with the lovely miss betty schaefer and basically admitting to us that he's in love with her and max is waiting for him in the shadows and what does max reveal uh, Max reveals that he is the one who made Norma a star. Right, because Max was a director. One of the three most promising yes. film directors of the time. And he and he put her fir- he was the first to put her in, on film. Yes. And in real life, the guy Eric von Stroheim, the Sounds guy who, right. who played Max, uh was a director of silent films and did indeed direct a young Gloria Swanson in silent films. And earlier in the film, they sit down in her uh, parlor or whatever, where they watch, where she watches herself on screen. Right. Um, the movie that they're watching is one of the films that Eric von Stroheim directed Gloria Swanson in as a young, younger woman in the silent film era. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, just kind of, kind of cool. But so, so this Max movie's... reveals like, not only that, but I was her first husband. Her first husband, and I think it's been revealed throughout the movie that she's already got three. She's been married three husbands. Times. Maybe the monkey was one of them. We're not sure. And here is Max, her butler, who's been sending fake fan mail to protect her ego and doing everything he can to protect her ego, is also a former director of her movies, made her a star, and is her first husband. And now he has himself sunken to this deranged position in her life. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the telling sign. That's the that's the moment for Joe. Where yeah. it's like, this is my future. Right. Right here. I'm looking at my future right now. Right. Um so he decides he's gonna get out of it. And and at this point, Betty has revealed that she is in love with Joe. Right. By the time we get to Max revealing who he really is. Um, Joe knows that she doesn't know that she wants to marry Artie anymore, and it's because he's in Joe's in her life now. Yeah. So this is where we where we find out she Norma's got a gun. Right. He comes in. Norma's like super jealous. Oh, Norma finds the script. I'm sorry. Norma doesn't have a gun yes. yet. Yes. Norma finds the script while Joe's asleep. Untitled Love Story. Love Story by Joe Gillis and Betty Schaefer. So so she becomes jealous. Um, jealous is a mild way to put it. Sure. Obsessed. Uh, so 
she we so she ends up buying a gun she ends up starting to like call betty at night yeah and it, it turns out that it's multiple times we don't see it we only see the one time right and joe finds her calling betty yeah walks into norma's room while norma's on the bed calling betty to hiss at her and i think at this point joe is probably ready to leave already he's i think he's thinking about going to be with betty at this point and then he finds this situation and he was sort of trying to figure out like can i tell betty like what would she do if she found out what i've been that i've been sort of leading this woman on so that way i could live a life of luxury right and so he finds out that norma's on the phone with betty and he tells betty the address and says come over yeah yeah he's like he's like i just he basically decides <clears throat> it was almost like he couldn't even bring himself to say it but he at least had the courage to let betty see this you know horrible life that he's cut out for himself or not even cut out for himself well yeah cut out for himself because he chose to stay that first time and to you know not fight against it when she had all his stuff moved in and this and that yeah so here he is he's cut out this trap for himself and he's like betty come to the address you'll see what i'm talking about and then he starts packing up his things uh, you know, he starts chucking off his watches and his cufflinks and all that, and he's like... Oh, no, no, that's after. That's after Betty. It is? It is. I thought he was doing that while Betty was on her way over. No, because he... So, okay, so Betty shows up. Yeah. Let's back it up a little bit. Um, So he tells Betty to come over. Betty shows up. Um, He gives her a tour of the and house. He's, and, I think, and I think Norma has, sh- has told him that, he, that she has a gun already. Yeah, she has. And it's she mentions actually, it so coolly at one yeah, point. Yeah, she's just like, you know I bought a gun. Yeah, earlier in the movie. She, yeah, she's literally just like, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and I bought a gun, and I stood in front of the mirror, and I thought about doing it. And she just says it like, oh, I picked up some bread on the way home. Yeah. Like, it's deranged. So what we see that I don't think Joe sees is that while they're waiting for Betty to show up, Norma is laying in the bed and the gun is with her in the bed. Yeah. Um, and so Betty shows up and he gives her the tour and sort of explains what he's doing. And she says to him, I never heard this. You right. never did it. I've never been here. Get your things and come home with me. Right. And he tells her no. He says, go back to Artie. You have a fiance, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And sends her on her way and she, and she leaves crying. Then he goes to pack his things. So it's not just that he needed to get away from Norma. He needed to do the right thing, period. He right. had been doing so much wrong that he felt like he had to do the right thing for Betty. And I think he thought he was not, not, she, he wasn't worthy of her. Right. Right. So he sent her away and then he went to go pack his things and he starts stripping all of his stuff off like, you know gets rid of the the cigarette case and the gold lighter and the watch watch the fancy links, watch yeah uh, watch chain all sorts of stuff and so he starts to leave <gasps> yes that just pointed me yeah to just a really brilliant little uh, moment that happens much earlier in the movie yeah new year's eve when he's running out of the house to go party with his younger friends uh and he's wearing his tux and everything and he's got that big gold watch chain it catches on the door and it catches on the door as he tries to get yeah, away yeah. i totally blanked on that it's like I first he, it. I'm, I'm always gonna bring you back like it's right yeah. it's a watch chain she bought him wearing a tux that he's that she bought trying to get out of a door that she owns right. and it all catches and hangs him up for a bit there right okay now where were we you're liking this movie even more now that we're talking about it right? yeah so <clears throat> um so he starts to leave. Yes. She grabs the gun. And as he gets outside, she follows him and she fires three bullets into him. He drops his stuff, staggers into the pool and dies. Kablooey. And then the people show up. The The cops show up. Cops and all of the reporters in town. Yeah. Including this um, head of Hopper I was talking about. Uh, yes. Sort of like a page six. uh so she she plays herself at the end of the film as sort of a entertainment kind of pre gossip. I mean, I don't think it's really the I don't know if they really had gossip rags back then, but I mean that's sort of like I feel like they were on the way in. It was like her beat was the was to talk about the gossip and so she was there playing herself. Yeah. Um waiting to watch the police escort this woman down. Right. Um and so the police are upstairs 
um, Paramount shows up with their news crew. Right, the Paramount the news cameras, team. And they set up in the foyer down the stairs. And uh, and Max comes up, and they're, he's, they're trying to figure out how to get her down, and he's like, the cameras are here. And she's like, the cameras are ready? Yeah. Like, she's putting her makeup on, trying yeah, to look beautiful. she's in front of her vanity, just, like, vamping and, like, like posing and yeah. making all these faces and, like, really just, what Putting would you call on. it? What was it? Putting powder on. Putting powder on, for sure. But, yeah, really just kind of, like, basking in her own image. And yeah. Just sort of like, oh. Like, this, this is my moment. I'm finally yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, she she's like the cameras are ready. Okay, I'll be right down. So she gets dressed and she descends down the stairs past all these reporters and cameramen and stuff. Yeah. And the, the Paramount guys are there, and and Max is like c- falls back into the director. He stands right. next to the cameras and he says, "Point, you know, aim the cameras at her." And he says, "Roll cameras," and she begins her her descent. Into both madness and uh, prison, <laughs> yeah, uh, or a, an institution of some kind. Um, and the music they play uh, is score from the movie, but it's got pieces of the Salome opera. Oh, I didn't in know that. The music. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So, so she comes down, and she gets down to the bottom of the stairs. Yeah. And she says the line that people get wrong all the time. The super famous line you, that everybody gets wrong. I'll give this one to you. Well, the the line the way every everybody else says it is always, "I'm ready for my close up now, Mister Demille," and it's almost the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, what she says in the movie is, uh, "Hang on, what is it?" She says, "Mister Demille, I'm ready for my close up now." And then do we fade to black? And that's is there, is there pretty much more after the that? end of the movie. Um... I can't remember if we hear more from Joe or not at the end. We definitely um, do while they're fishing his corpse out of the pool. Yeah, that's before. That's pretty rough stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so basically after killing Joe, poor Norma has gone. Well, I don't know if I can say poor Norma. But Norma, <laughs> uh, judge her as you will, has convinced herself that she's just living in a completely separate world where she's about to make a movie with... Cecil B. DeMille, and she's a young, beautiful movie star all over again, and everything is just fine. And even, uh, did you mention even, like, how the cops say, like, well, maybe if we tell her Mr. DeMille's downstairs, that'll... Yeah, that'll well, get they're like, they're like well, there. nothing else will get her down there, so... Yeah. Um, so she's, she's, she's just living off her own ego at this point, and, yeah. and it's all about her now. So did you think this was a good movie? Yes. I, I did, too. I really liked it. It's interesting how um, perception changes and how yeah. perception at the time, especially in the 30s and 40s, um, from critics and executives have changed. Um, even even as late as like the 60s, um, I think about movies like, um, like uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah. You know, um, the, uh, the studio hated Moon River. Oh, really? And, uh, and you know, there's like a famous thing where, where Audrey Hepburn threatened them over removing that. Wow. Um, and, uh, and they kept it and I'm like, you know, it's, it's a river. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the wizard of Oz, you know, was critically, um, seen very poorly. It was. Uh, yeah. When it was released, it was not received well by critics. Um, wow. and in this film, um, studio heads didn't like the, the movie um mm. the the head of mgm um uh I'm trying to remember what he said he said uh that billy wilder should be tarred and feathered oh my god really for the film billy wilder as we know what he has said about the monkey yeah. his response was fuck you <laughs> that was his official response <laughs> that's great that is so great um simple yet elegant yeah well maybe not that elegant that's funny. Yeah, it really is. Um, but the the movie ended up getting nominated for you know like uh, Glory Swanson got a Best Actress nomination for this. I would hope um, so. She was she was nominated with Betty Davis. Cool. Um, Betty Davis was nominated for All About Eve, which might be in our bucket. I think because uh, didn't you say you have not seen it? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's in the bucket. Okay. Um, and so uh, 
it's interesting because they're two sort of like heavyweights, Betty yeah. Davis and and Gloria Swanson. And these films, both films, deal with aging actresses. Um, and All About Eve deals with an aging actress being kind of usurped by uh, a younger actress yeah. um, coming onto the scene. Uh, so they're sort of both about kind of like has-beens, and they both have really famous lines. The All About Eve has the it's going to be a bumpy ride line. All right. Um, and uh, neither of them won. Oh. And the the presumption is that because they were so both big, yeah, they canceled each other out. Wow. Judy Holiday. You heard of Judy Holiday? I don't think I have. Yeah, me neither. Uh, won the Best Actress Oscar for a movie called Born Yesterday. You know, that classic you love, Born Yesterday. I'm wow. sure it's a great film. I don't mean to demean Born Yesterday or Judy Holiday. The point is that, uh, I mean, Gloria Swanson in this is... She's a force of nature. And I've seen all about Eve, and Betty Davis is great. Gloria Swanson in this is fantastic. Yeah. She just dominates every scene she's in just with that look on her face, that painted lipstick yeah, smile those, sneer. Those, those sharpie eyebrows, mm-hmm. the Cruella de Vil sneer. And the, the big white teeth, I mean, just... The constant, like, surprised eyes, like, always just like, what are you doing here, eyes? And I think, and I think a big piece of casting somebody who actually was in silent film was really important in that... Her, every gesture she made was big, which is how you told silent film. Right. She says in the movie that like we didn't we didn't need words, we had faces. Right, and uh, another great line, you know, we didn't need words, we had faces. We had faces, um, Joe. So, you know, like having somebody who who truly understood that and actually lived that, I think, is really important for the embodiment of of Norma. Um, there was another moment in the studio that we kind of didn't really talk about that i just want to mention real quick again talking about the sort of the silent film thing because right. a big big part of the premise is that she was the silent film star who lost her work because of talkies because of talkies and that this idea that maybe um this grand way in which she spoke in her performance doesn't yeah. work right um but there's a moment when she first sits down in, in demille's chair yeah um a Boom, Mike swings in and kind of bumps her, That's right. her veil. Yeah. And she looks up at it with disdain and she swipes it away. Get this get this talky device out of my right. face. Um, so uh, I, I think that's interesting. I think that it's also interesting that both she and Betty Davis were nominated and um, as has sort of has been characters. And right. Neither of them won. But um, Judy Holiday got it. Yeah, Judy Holiday. Uh, there's also another line in the movie that I know that you chuckled at when they when they said it, and uh, um, Joe Gillis says something um, about a, a story or a, a potential s- script, and he says, uh, "The Love It and Pomona." I think when he's talking to um, Norma the first time, right? Oh yeah, The Love It and Pomona, which is kind of funny. I mean, Pomona sort of represents like every town, you know. Nobody yeah. knows. Especially at that time, nobody knew where Pomona was unless you lived in California. Right. Um, but interestingly, Pomona is also where they did a lot of their test screenings. Oh. So what would happen is um, the executives would drive out to 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 Pomona. Yes. Pomona, California, not too far from where we sit right now. Yep. But and far enough that I'm not going today. Correct. So they would drive out there. They would do the test screening. They would get the report cards. They would take those report cards and continue driving to Palm Springs where they would relax and oh discuss the the report cards basically that sounds like a fun way to spend a weekend yeah i just thought that was kind of kind of an interesting note uh so yeah so that's sunset boulevard. sunset boulevard that's our two movies for for this week do you wow, have anything so you want to add it's been um, a long podcast well my today. coffee countdown yeah let's do coffee countdown for sunset boulevard mm-hmm. was zero i nice. didn't doze off once and Fantastic. I was drastically underslept, and I hadn't had a whole lot of coffee. Yeah. But Sunset Boulevard locked me in. Yeah. Good movie. I loved it. Yeah. Really? Uh... Twice in a row. All right. The Muppet Bucket has not really steered us wrong. No. With movies we didn't want to see. Correct. You know? So I think it's time to do the Muppet Bucket. Let's draw from the Muppet Bucket. It's, it's been a long podcast. I apologize for how it long has it has been. But you know what? We're going to talk about movies in detail. It's going to happen probably it every week or every other week. Okay. Mix this up. Really well for Steve. 
All right, Steve. I'm reaching into the Muppet bucket. Dune, 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 Dune. That's me rooting for Dune. Because I just really feel like watching Dune lately. And that's probably not a healthy feeling. Paths of Glory. Wow. We just have not watched a modern film yet. Mm -mm. Paths of Glory. Isn't that from like the 30s? Alright, I'm drawing mine. Doom, 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 it's doom, not doom, doom, darn it. Interesting. What is it? Steve, I believe you put this in the bucket. Oh? Career Opportunities. Nice! So that's more of a modern film, That'll huh? That would be a really big change of pace. That's like an yeah. 80s film, right? Uh, no, 90s. 91-ish. That's the Frank Whaley movie. Frank Whaley with... <sighs> Jennifer Connelly. Okay. In 1991-ish or 2-ish. I've never seen Career Opportunities, so... Um, one of my favorites. Uh, I've got it on DVD. Uh, it's also on HBO Go right now. Um, and it's just a very funny, very underappreciated movie about... Uh, well, we'll get into it on the next one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, so the movies to watch next over the next two weeks are Paths of Glory and Career Opportunities. So. That's right. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, thanks again to Dwayne Sawyer. Thanks to uh, Indiana R two D two Joker or Indiana, something. Indiana Joke R two D two. Uh, and uh, Space Colonizer. Yes. For your suggestions, we uh, look forward to hearing from you guys on Twitter um, at Stephen No Howood and at Movie Hippo and at No Lag Gamers. Thanks again, guys. Thanks. Oh, Bon Cinema.